You're listening to Reba Radio. Real inclusive, brilliant action. It's the 1880s, and around the time the RIBA was receiving a supplemental royal charter, Heinrich Hertz was discovering radio waves. And across the Atlantic, Emma Lazarus is putting pen to paper to write the new Colossus to raise money for the foundations of one of the most embracing symbols of inclusion in our world. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbour that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. When many think of our profession of architecture, and certainly as we admire the classic features of even this building here in Portland Place, the shadows of brazen Greek giants loom large, and the Royal Institute's conquering past with its feet planted firmly, surely, unapologetically in some lands it didn't care to understand, now finds the ground beneath different, changing, now, don't worry, I'm not about to claim myself the mother of exiles, but here at the RABA, we now have the opportunity to transform ourselves and the profession from Greek giant to mighty being, to open our gates and raise a flame, a beacon of light to welcome in all those who've been previously intentionally or unintentionally rejected. But how do we do that? We look to the 1890s, and as the first copies of the Reba Journal were being dispersed, a Marconi experimented with broadcasting. Well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel to use these opportunities to spread messages. I'm not going to say too much about CQ cultural intelligence now, as you'll hear plenty over the next seven days broadcasting. What I will say is what we do now with this radio station, what we start here, is not just a radio station for seven days. We embrace an opportunity, an opportunity to strike the match, to reach in and inflame the wick, to start to build the muscle around the bones of the arm and begin to lift our lamp beside our golden doors. The RIBA and the architectural sector can be the newest colossus, built on a foundation, grain by grain of sand, pushed together with an inclusive mesh of hope and of action. And we must act, for words dispersed across the ether are otherwise empty. So let us learn how. Welcome to day one of Reba Radio. Broadcasting your inclusion journey online, 18th to the 26th of November. You're listening to Reba Radio. Woohoo! We're underway! Good morning, Vietnam! <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like. Well, that was another radio station. I'll channel, I'll, I'll channel my inner Robin Williams. Broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects. This is Reba Radio. God, <laughs> you can tell this is the first day. They'll get it. They'll get it by the end of the week. Uh, it's great to be able to bring you the insight, information, actions, ideas to help you move from knowing you want to be better at inclusive action to actual tangible outcomes. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you do that over the coming days. And it's all rooted in the foundational behavioral principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. My name is Marsha Ramroop. I'm the director of inclusion here at the RIBA. 
I want you to know that beyond CQ, beyond that, we're looking at bias. We're looking at the lived experience of different groups. We're tackling some sticky, meaty subjects like white shame and race. And we're talking about inclusive recruitment. We're talking architectural education with the Future Architects Front. We're going head on in to discuss decolonialization in architecture. But more than that, at every stage, we're talking actions, we're talking solutions, we're talking measures, we're talking outcomes. We're doing the talking so you can do the doing and create change. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place. I'm Marsha Ramroop, the Director of Inclusion at the RIBA, and we're just getting started. We're just getting started with our attempt to give you the background, the information, the insight that you need to take real, inclusive, brilliant action, RIBA. Reba, you see, we don't just throw this stuff together, you know? Shock stats. And every day we'll be starting with some statistics to get you going and to begin with. Did you know that the percentage of the UK population that's white, able-bodied, heterosexual men based in London and the South East is only 3.1% of the UK population? In architecture, why able-bodied, heterosexual men based in London and the South East? Do they only make up 3.1% of the demographics of the profession? Gives new meaning to the word minority, right? But on the other side of the coin, businesses that are diverse and inclusive are eight times more likely to have better business outcomes. More like this to come over the coming days. Well, I'm I'm not going to hang around. Let us get straight to it. Um, you've seen that we're rooting the themes of this radio station around the idea of cultural intelligence CQ. But what is this? Why this approach as opposed to any other? How do we use it? Well, to answer this question, we were really super fortunate to be joined by Dr. David Livermore. And he's the president of the Cultural Intelligence Centre, the head honcho, if you like, leading this work globally. He was in London a couple of weeks ago and I grabbed him for an in-depth chat so we could share the answers to those questions with you. We recorded in the Lutchens room and you can really really hear the ambience in there. Uh, you can see the whole interview subtitled on Reba's YouTube channel. And of course, I started by asking him, what is CQ? Saying cultural intelligence is the capability to work effectively with anyone who comes from a different background than you. Um, usually people say, oh, okay, so you do work in cultural sensitivity. And I say, mm, sort of. Like, obviously you have to be sensitive to cultures if you're gonna be culturally intelligent, but you could be culturally sensitive and not be very culturally intelligent. What I mean by that is cultural intelligence is a skill set. It's can I actually work effectively with people who have very different backgrounds than I do. So I've, I've actually in the academic space worked with PhDs in intercultural studies who could spout off to you lots of cultural differences, but can't for the life of them work with their own colleague who comes from a very different cultural background than them. So cultural intelligence is translating that sensitivity, that awareness, that understanding into actually being able to work together effectively. Why CQ? Mm, that's a question we get a lot. So it's just an abbreviation for cultural intelligence quotient. As you know, uh, the work is really rooted in the study of intelligences. So just as IQ refers to intelligence quotient and EQ, emotional intelligence quotient, CQ is your cultural intelligence. So can you tell me a little bit more about that research background? You talked about working with Sunang and Lynn Van Dyne. What, what is that research? What, what research did they do? Yeah, I'll see if I can be succinct about 20 plus years of research, but where they began is to develop what we call a conceptual framework, a hypothesis about what do we think will predict whether or not people are able to work effectively with different cultures. And so that's where our work is rooted in the multiple intelligences work by Sternberg and Detterman. And so people would more practically know their work through the realm of things like emotional intelligence, 
practical intelligence, social intelligence. And in all these different forms of intelligence, there are typically four different competencies, if you will, that help predict how well people would do with that. So as you do in most good research, it started with a hypothesis. We developed hypotheses about how people would behave in each of those areas. And then they began to develop items. I already said I'm not a quantitative researcher, so I take no credit for the instrument. But they began to develop items to say, how people respond to these may give us some indication of how they score in these different facets, these competencies. But then we had to test and find out, are these at all connected to reality? So I might say, oh yes, I'm very interested in different cultures. And all the people who work with me are like, uh, I've never seen that out of him. And so we had to keep working on the validation of it to say, does how I score myself, does how you score me, correlate with what we actually see of that individual reality. And so that was many years of refining and validating it until we had items that we were confident with a high level of predictability would say, yes, more than likely when you see someone score that way, you can expect you're going to see this behavior. So what's the difference then in terms of CQ being a measurement that is useful and a skill than say IQ, which is just seen as a measurement, can you improve it? What's the difference, would you say? Yeah, so the, the IQ space, as you would know well, Marcia has a lot of controversy over whether or not it's fixed or not. I'll leave that to the people in that area of expertise to, to speak to that. I, I would certainly say I hold very much to a growth mindset that would seem to say there's chances to, to improve. We would absolutely say that cultural intelligence is malleable and you raise an important point I forgot to mention in the research. Because we were looking at skills, we pulled out anything that was explicitly a, an innate trait, something that is hardwired within me that I can't really change about myself. So by focusing on skills, we said, let's specifically look at things where people with experience, with coaching, with training, with development and intentionality, you can absolutely expect to see growth and improvement. So any score you would get on CQ, I would say to you, with interventions and intent intentionality, you could see that score improve. You say that the research has been um, ongoing for the last 20 years or so. Um, how much is that research peer reviewed and tested by others? Oh goodness. <laughs> uh, we're, we're high, have high, high regard for the essential nature that it has to be peer reviewed. So uh, hundreds of studies now that we're very gratified to say have been published in A-level peer reviewed journals. Um, and that's, that's really important to us because um, now it goes well beyond the center that I'm privileged to lead where we have 40 some staff but instead there are now researchers from 50 different countries that have used this in 170 different countries so the global scope of it has really required an, a, a community of scholars who have worked together as peers and then as you know it's one thing for someone with vested interest to say, no, no, this is valid and it's reliable. It's another whole thing when another group of academic scholars with no vested stake in the cultural intelligence assessment to say, oh no, it actually did predict what it said it was going to predict. Mm. Well, speaking of that assessment, um, people have to do, they, they log onto a portal and, and they um, can measure their CQ. Um, to, to measure how effective they are working relating with those who are different from them. It shows where they might be in terms of, um, you know, the bottom or middle or, or top groupings of the world's respondents. But who are participants actually benchmarking themselves against? Mm. Yeah, excellent question. So when you get a score relative to the global norms in that capability, you're being compared against the 250,000 other individuals who have taken the assessment. Um, why should I care about that? That's a question I often get from people. Like, who are these people? I don't know who these 250,000 are. Well, a couple things. For one thing, nobody ever views your CQ unless they're from the CQ Center, but nobody ever views your CQ in light of what number you got on a particular capability. They compare your CQ with other people that they know. And so what I would say is, well, that does represent a very global uh, 
community of, of sampling of participants, it does skew more toward the professional community. So it would be important for you to know of how am I faring in this compared to other people who are global professionals working across the world. Um, the other thing I would say though, you, you obviously know this, but important for those across Reba who are thinking about this is you can also get much more specific and look at how your scores compare with other people within your organization or even within your team. And that's when it becomes really interesting. Like, okay, now it really matters to me if I'm scoring above or in the top percentile against my colleagues that I'm working with day in and day out and how's that going to affect the way that they perceive me, perceive me my promotional development opportunities and those kinds of things. And what the assessment shows as well is not just CQ um, ratings across the capabilities which like you say we'll discuss in a second but um, preferences around cultural values. Could you explain a little bit more about the cultural values, where they come from? Yeah, so as, as you know, the cultural values profile is entirely separate portion um, from the CQ assessment. So this is measuring purely preferences, not something that we're trying to get people to change. On things like, do I prefer a more individualist approach to my work? Let me work autonomously. Let me kind of do my own thing or a more collectivist. Let's work on a project together all day long through consensus, etc. cetera. Um, many of your listeners will be familiar with this work from the, the works of people like the late Geert Hofstede, Trompenars, Edward Hall. So there's been a lot of people who have done excellent work on this and we stand on their shoulders to really look at that. What we look at are 10 cultural values that we find have some of the most significance in the workplace for the way that you interact across teams. So it becomes an extremely useful way to say, oh wow, I tend toward a more direct communication style, but all my direct reports, all the people I supervise are more indirect. So maybe that's why they keep bristling every time I give them feedback. So it's not about saying I have to entirely change my, my preferred communication style, but I may have to work to take off some of the blunt edge if I hope to motivate these people effectively. And there are 10 cultural values, but like Hofstede came up with six, I think. Yeah. So where, where do the cultural intelligence, you know, find the other four? Yeah, I mean, there are actually a couple dozen of them out there. So we, they, these 10 values, well, they, they have a lot of overlap with ones that you'll see in some of the other individuals work. The items for them are things that the Cultural Intelligence Center developed ourselves. Um, and so the, the other four come from places like the Globe Leadership Study. You'll see some similarity from things like Edward Hall's work in, in Trompenars and that. But these were 10 that through our more qualitative work, we saw were repeatedly creating interference on teams. And so that's why we decided to develop our own survey to really look at them. And the two really work together effectively, the cultural values and the cultural intelligence, because sometimes when I'll have a group of skeptics who are like, okay, so this is where you come in and tell me how racist I am. Before we even get to that conversation, which I'm quite interested to get into with them, but before we do, it's, hey, before we even start talking about race and privilege and all that, let's just look at the very real value differences that exist. Help me figure out how to work better with the people who communicate very differently than I do. David Livermore, president of the CQ Centre, speaking to me about the background CQ. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to hear from Dr. Pragya Agarwal, the author of Sway, about bias, uh, what it is and how we challenge it. But first, back to Dr. David Livermore of the CQ Centre. We continue with our exploration of what is CQ. We've heard the background to it. Now the detail. So now looking at cultural intel intelligence itself, it has these four capabilities we talked about and the research was done and these four capabilities was identified. So let's go through those. Um, uh, we have CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy and CQ action. I don't even know why I'm looking at my sheet of paper, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> but if we can take them one by one, CQ drive, what's that about? Yeah, so, so drive is just the degree to which you're interested and even motivated to understand the background of a colleague. And in one way, this is one of those things from social science research that sounds 
patently obvious. Like, of course, the culturally intelligent are more interested in people from different backgrounds. But think about how often we overlook that. We so quickly move into, here's what you need to understand about people from a BAME background. Which person from a BAME background? Here's what you need to understand about your millennial workers. Here's what you need to understand about the differently able. And we assume that knowledge by itself is just going to automatically translate into performance and success. So you have to first get at more that heart issue of why should I even care and why is your background at all relevant to this work-related project that we're working on? Yeah, essentially, I, I always talk about CQ drive, the motivation about do you want to? Do you actually want to work and relate with those who are different from you? So um, within CQ Drive, um, what, what does that mean? What, what do people have to look at and pinpoint? Well, you know, so you and I might disagree on this, and I, I welcome that. In some ways, I would say in a work setting, it might be best if it starts by talking about a very work performance oriented outcome. So I might be more motivated to understand your background if you help me see how knowing that is going to help me get a better outcome over here. You know, what does it have to do with architecture? You know, like, like I, I'm a good person and I don't want to be racist and I want to understand that, but why am I talking about this at work? So I would say what it looks like in part is getting people very focused on an objective that that team cares about. And then along the way, hopefully we start to also discover like, whoa, you have some great insights that I would love for my kids to learn about or that I could really incorporate into the way that I engage in my community or my faith expression or whatever else it might be. So, so for me, I would say you start with what we measure as the extrinsic interest, what's in it for me to actually do this related to a work-oriented outcome. Because I think too many of our EDI efforts have for too long just used EDI is an end in and of itself and wondered why people are like, we're just doing this to be politically correct and instead of saying, well, there are good reasons just to do it, but it will also have good outcomes for us as a team. Yes. Are so you going to disagree with me? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to disagree with you. I, obviously, um, CQ Drive, it's got its um, three uh, subcategories of intrinsic interest, extrinsic interest, and self-efficacy. And uh, personally, I'm more driven by the intrinsic because I've always found it quite dehumanizing to uh, reduce um, inclusion efforts to what's the bottom line here? Yeah. How, how are we going to get a better productivity outcome, especially from those from, from underrepresented groups? So, um, so uh, if, if, if I have to convince an individual that they have to somehow treat those underrepresented as humans rather than just a number on a balance sheet, then um, that's, that's quite a difficult position for me to take. But if I'm able to inspire and, and convince and uh, create transformative change through saying, this is what's great about it. We can, we can have an amazing, like very idealistic, a very utopian idea that we can all work effectively and relate so much better as a society if we treat humans as humans rather than some as uh, better than others. Um, I find that the intrinsic motivators may be more difficult to try to eke out of people, but ultimately more long lasting than in saying, well, um, you know, we, we're just going to get a better productivity output there. Um, so that's how I think CQ Drive can be used effectively. But really importantly, that third piece about self-efficacy, mm. because we, you've mentioned race a few times and within especially race, I think more than even gender these days or, or feminism um, is that idea of discomfort, that idea of defensiveness. The idea of fear, cancel culture, when, when you get it wrong. So, so talk to me about your view on the self-efficacy subcategory of CQ Drive. Yeah, self-efficacy becomes critically important to all of this. And if I think about talking to people who look like me as compared to talking to people who look like you at the risk of putting either one of us in, in boxes, um, I'm going to put the onus of responsibility more this way for all the reasons that you just mentioned, and you know that I, I concur with the concern of if this becomes exploitive to just use people of color to come up with a better bottom line, I appreciate and agree with you that that's not a good place to live long term. But because of that history, I think all often the self-efficacy is uh, 
impacted by marginalized group because here I go again. I'm the one, the, I spent my whole life having to code switch, etc. cetera. Um, so really you're asking me to do the emotional work again to try and adapt. And so I think it comes, uh, the onus is first and foremost on people. I'll be much harder on people who look like me to say we need to go into the uncomfortable conversation. But, but what if someone calls me a racist? Well, get over it, you know? Like it, it's a lot harder to be called some racist epitaph than to once or twice in your life be told that maybe you had a racist thing that was there. So the self-efficacy is difficult because we can feel like, ah, in this charged environment, I don't even know what I can say. But if we aren't willing to have those bold conversations and know we're going to get it wrong some of the time, um, we aren't really going to move anywhere on it. So, I don't, you may have a whole different way you want to go with that conversation, but that was kind of the first thing that came to mind on, on self-efficacy. Well, coming up on Reba Radio around CQ Drive, we will be tackling the issues of fear, cancel culture. We'll be looking at discomfort and the idea of white shame, especially around racism. So uh, that's part of it. And we'll also be looking at how we can use a data piece as well to motivate change and how we can intrinsically motivate ourselves towards inclusive change as well. But the second capability, CQ knowledge, I always call this the biggest piece of the puzzle because you can never know everything about everything and everyone, um, which is why we need to surround ourselves with a diversity of lived experience and backgrounds. But how would you describe CQ knowledge? Yeah, I mean, you've described it well. It's, it's the core understanding you need to be able to enter into a room and begin to read people and read a situation. And I'm going to be very susceptible to reading that wrong if I just rely upon the knowledge that I've always kind of known of how you read people, etc. So uh, I, you're right, it, it can be extremely overwhelming. Uh, in part two, it's, it's the area of the four capabilities that people tend to score lowest. The good news is it's also the one that's easiest to improve. We, we, that's why we so often default to it. You can read books, you can go to seminars, you can surround yourself with people from different backgrounds. So what I would say is, at least as a starting point or a next step for people, try not to be so overwhelmed by how am I ever going to possibly know the history of all the different cultural identities that are represented across a place like Reba, et cetera. And instead, that's where we focus on things like these cultural values, all of us have some wiring in us toward one end of these cultural values or another. So we start by, if you can understand some of those core values and then start to look for indicators of whether or not someone is more risk averse than another person or whether or not someone prefers a more long-term orientation to how they think about the world of architecture versus a more short term. That can be a way to make it feel a little bit less daunting. And then to your point to just kind of fuel your ongoing drive through the knowledge to say, oh, for the rest of my life, there's always more I can be learning about the, this fascinating, diverse world in which we live. Good leaders, they, they adapt their style all the time. So what's the difference between being an adaptive leader without CQ and one that adapts with CQ? Yeah, so one of the things that sometimes drives people nutty is just how much leaders rely on their gut to read a situation. And uh, the surprising thing is research says that the gut actually is a pretty good barometer for a seasoned leader to read a situation and to adapt kind of on the fly unless there are cultural differences involved. And so the very thing that's said to you in the past, those people are about ready to sign or those people are disengaged may actually mean something entirely different. So it's just an additional tool to put in your adaptive leadership style. Yeah, there's many other ways that leaders have already learned to adapt, but without understanding the cultural differences, there may be a critical piece that you're missing light of. So at Rebe Radio, around CQ knowledge, we'll be looking at the diversity of lived experiences, how the underrepresented in architecture um, can be more represented and the impact of that underrepresentation. So we'll be examining the lives of women, the gender pay gap, the pressure of unpaid care. We'll be looking at race and racism with the science journalist uh, Angela Saini um, and we'll be exploring social mobility in the profession as well as LGBTQ plus lives and disability.
David Livermore, president of the CQ Centre, speaking to me about the first two capabilities of CQ, recorded in the Lutchens room here at 66 Portland Place. And we'll have more from him. Coming up later today, we're going to hear from architects Yemi Eludran and Mariam al Ikhaim about the state of inclusion in the profession today. But for now, we started looking at what is CQ. We've heard some background to it, started looking at the four key capabilities. We've heard about CQ Drive and CQ Knowledge. And if you've missed it, don't worry, you've not missed it. It'll all be repeated in about four hours time. But for now, we'll continue with that exploration of what is CQ with David Livermore, the president of the CQ Centre. The third capability, CQ strategy. I always call this the most important of the CQ puzzle because if you're motivated and you have some knowledge and you go straight into action without CQ strategy, you're likely to act in a stereotypical and tokenistic way. What's your take on CQ strategy? Well, I, I'm with you. It's, it's my favorite anyway, because I feel like this is what really filled in the gap for me when we began to look at the research findings. Of course, you know that the technical term here is metacognition. Can I think about thinking? So I come in and I say, oh, I'm going to be meeting with a British individual from Reba. Oh, but you don't look like what I expected in British. Now, I wonder if I should suddenly speak to someone who's Caribbean maybe, but I'm not entirely sure. So strategy is I come in with some kind of best guess about the kind of culture that I'm going to be interacting with, but can I adapt on the fly based upon the cues that I'm receiving? So strategy is all about, I go into this meeting anticipating what's gonna be appropriate for the context and the little bit of background that I have on an individual. In the midst of it, am I aware of myself and the other individual and am I reading the cues accurately? And then can I adjust as needed and find ways to check for understanding? So the strategy piece really is the hinge pin between translating my motivation and understanding into can I actually act in a way that's culturally intelligent? I like to use Eisenhower at this point. He said, planning is everything, but the plan is nothing. So mm. thinking about all the different scenario that can come up. And uh, there are three um, uh, subcategories to CQ strategy, planning, uh, self-awareness, and uh, checking your assumptions. And checking your assumptions, it, I mean, it's massive, isn't it? I, I like to quote, well, I'm great for a quote, uh, Timothy Wilson, um, who's professor of mm. psychology at the University of Virginia. He wrote the book, Stranger to Ourselves, Discovering the Adaptive conscious and he wrote that about 20 years ago um, with with this idea that we have 11 million bits of information going into our brain at any given moment mm. but the conscious capacity to process just 40 and so we're, we're shortcutting information all the time uh, or if you know it's a a, a, a biological cerebral need to, to make assumptions to fill in gaps ourselves and and when we're particularly under stress this is this is when we're doing that so what would you say were the main ways that people could check their assumptions mm. part of it is just making a very conscious effort to stop oneself in the midst of it and say it appears to me x but before I act on that assumption, I need to figure out whether or not that's actually true. Because to your point, we're, we're making split judgments all the time. And this is actually where CQ strategy becomes mo one of the most powerful tools to manage unconscious bias. Yes, we all have implicit biases, but with strategy, I'm stopping to, to actually acknowledge the fact that I'm biased toward thinking that means you're rude or that means you're incompetent. And I need to check that out before I, I just follow up on that. I would say another way that you can actually um, employ the checking or the suspending of assumptions is before any individuals are involved to write up some objective criteria. So we often talk about this in the hiring process. Before you even get involved in who you're going to hire, have some very objective criteria that everybody signs off on and agree on. And then as you begin to talk about, oh, she's the perfect fit, or we really need to look at that. Well, help me understand that because three of our criteria aren't aligned at all with what this individual has. So it now kind of creates an accountability piece that, that helps us check on that. So those are a couple ways. It's a very kind of methodical checklist approach to kind of put the brakes on what our brains are doing to quickly to, to default to assuming what's there. 
So self-awareness is also very important, um, asking yourself, you know, what, what am I actually bringing to the party? And I'm often asked how EQ, emotional intelligence, is different from CQ, cultural intelligence. Where CQ picks up is where EQ leaves off. And there's no research in the emotional intelligence work that indicates my ability to manage and detect your emotional state is going to be accurate if you come from a, an unfamiliar cultural background than me. So I might assume that your silence means you're giving me the silent treatment. You may actually presume that you're being respectful to me because I haven't actually asked you to say anything yet. So um, it is where they overlap. The self-awareness, emotional intelligence always has to be a part of what I'm doing engaged in that. It's also um, being aware that I can't have this conversation right now because I'm too fatigued and I'm, I'm going to be too abrupt with someone. So it's having that awareness of maybe today isn't the best time for me to engage in this. And then cultural intelligence is more about can I detect the emotional state of someone who's unfamiliar with me and, and mitigate some of the um, friction that might happen as we compare our emotions with one another. And on Reba Radio, we'll be exploring how you can use CQ strategy planning, just like Dave says, in inclusive recruitment, in architectural education, uh, as well as checking our assumptions about architecture outside of London, uh, internationally, as well as looking policy making around the menopause, and then self-awareness around the impact uh, discriminatory behaviour can have. And the final CQ uh, capability, CQ action, ultimately we actually have to do the work. We have to put these behaviours into action to be more inclusive and, and this involves putting in you know, a, a few different steps. So summarise CQ action for me. Yeah, CQ action is the degree to which I can adapt my behavior as needed when the situation requires it. And it's, it's important to put those qualifications in because we don't want cultural appropriation. We don't want you know, people like me to think I can suddenly pretend I have a British accent or something, you know, to, to use a very benign example, but much more so to suddenly be placating someone's interest. But on the other hand, if I'm not willing to adapt and accommodate at all a difference, then I don't have cultural intelligence at all. So you're right, the, the action piece is ultimately the only thing that your coworkers, your clients, your stakeholders really care about. Did you behave in a way that was true to yourself? You weren't trying too hard to fit in, but demonstrated you could offer flexibility when you saw that my preference was different than yours. That's a really important point you just made there because people from underrepresented groups, um, whether in architecture or outside, so women racialized groups in particular, we can spend a lot of time doing uh, what's been described as coding. So uh, an adaptation that's rooted in, in hiding who we are in order to fit in. What's the difference between those kinds of actions and then uh, CQ action adaptation? Yeah, so I actually think code switching or, or coding is an example of CQ action, though the motivation behind it might be less than what we would hope for. And I often say, realizing that this could come off the wrong way, but to underrepresented groups, you already have an edge on knowing how to do this because you've been doing it your whole life. Where I demonstrate, I hope, some sensitivity to that is, and I don't want the onus to only be on you to have to be the one who continues to do that. So I think to your point, CQ action and a, a place that's truly about equity, diversity, and inclusion eventually needs to get to the place of, but you shouldn't have to cover who you are. You shouldn't have to say, oh, I have to temper down what I'm really thinking here because the white guys in the room can't handle it or some other cultural group. You want you to be able to bring your full self but that we've together agreed upon some norms of, hey, we're all going to use a modicum of respect, so let's talk about why it is that you felt the most respectful way was to be very blunt, and I felt like it was to be you know, very diplomatic and talk about that, et cetera. So we need some kind of shared norms um, that we're agreeing to adapt ourselves to, the challenge is all too often that the norms default to the dominant culture. And so if we're really going to be about EDI, we have to take a critical eye on those norms and say, 
Are they really uh, about what is the most global approach to respect, or is it just the way certain people think that respect should be done? So long answer to your question, I think coding is an example of CQ action in that it's, oh, how do I say this in a way that will make sense to them? But we eventually want to get to a place where people are free to be themselves and don't have to cover the authenticity of who they actually are. On Reba Radio, amongst other things, we'll be looking at adaptations that work, how underrepresented can be better supported, and the actions that result in inclusive outcomes. David Livermore, president of the CQ Centre, speaking to me about the CQ capabilities, and we'll have more from him about some of the criticism of CQ shortly. You're listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, brilliant action, with Marsha Remu. You're listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to hear from Dr. Pragya Agarwal, the author of Sway, about bias, how it, what it is, how we challenge it, and that's going to be live. I, I'm so excited about that. Uh, for now, we're going to continue with our exploration of what is CQ with David Livermore, the president of the CQ Centre. We've heard all about the four capabilities, uh, but we all recognise that no concept is perfect. So I really did take it on the chin here and decided to challenge Dave about those things. Everything isn't always rosy in CQ world, and sometimes there's some serious questions yeah. that come back at us about, well, what is this all about? And really, what are we trying to do here? Now, the CQ materials, you go on the portal, they're very American in their outlook. How are other cultures and, and nationalities supposed to navigate it? Yeah, so this, this is certainly something that strikes right at the core of, of my heart. The Cultural Intelligence Center obviously needs to bear in mind whether or not we ourselves are culturally intelligent in the way that people access our tools. So a couple things. First of all, I would say, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that the origins of the model itself and even many of the ways that we express the model and the materials are rooted in our work with our colleagues in Singapore, which is a very global team of Europeans, Asians, Middle Easterns, as well as Americans. So there might be a little bit of confirmation bias there, people coming into a US organization going, oh, it's, it's American. Having said that, I certainly can see some very real examples where it's true. And it's one of the key priorities that we've given to our director of our UK programs, Ratika Wadwa, who has also voiced some of these concerns. And we've asked her to really help us take a look and say, how do we make a very specific British friendly understanding? And we're talking about the same thing with our colleagues in South Africa, also in India and other parts of Asia. So we're, we're really trying to put this to practice of saying you have to localize it. There will never be any such thing as a global, uh, much less thinking that the American is global approach. And we're having some of these talks inside that we talk to our clients about, like what do we look at that we can live with that gives us a shared global language and understanding, but then as it gets into details and the actual tools and representation, make sure that it takes on the local flavors and cultures of the places where we work. The assessment itself, how accessible is the assessment and e-learning for the neurodiverse, for those with other conditions, um, you know, that might make it difficult to navigate online content? Yeah, excellent question. And that's... Uh, an area we're making progress, but I think it's probably one of the areas that we're still weakest in. Um, so we definitely are working to make sure all of our assessments and our e-learnings are compliant um, and as accessible as possible to groups that have a variety of different abilities, as you've noted. Um, we have had some instances where individuals who are at various places along the spectrum or have different aspects where they find themselves within neurodiversity where uh, they may have done an audible version of the assessment or a Scantron version on paper, but that's not scalable. We have to work through much more scalable initiatives on that. Because we're researchers at heart, we don't want to be too quick to just put a Band-Aid on something that isn't really getting at the core of what's going to truly address that. So there's some research that's being done. 
also some research that's asking to what degree does CQ link to your ability to effectively work with people who, ref who reflect uh, neurodiversity and, and other abilities. So it's very much on our radar. It's one of our strategic priorities. We've made some baby steps in moving in that direction, but much more that needs to happen and much more that you should expect to see and continue to hold us accountable for. Um, now, these criticisms are more about access to CQ and the use of it rather than the fundamental um, principles of CQ itself. But then what other concerns should we be thinking about when thinking about CQ if you're to apply CQ lens to yeah. CQ? No, it's a great question. I, I sometimes say there's some people who are more committed to CQ than I am. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that I'm deeply committed to the work that we've been able to do, but it's a tool. It's one part of an effective EDI strategy. So if you look at this as the silver bullet that cultural intelligence alone will assess and be the strategy for everything, no, it has to fit in with the intentional behavior and people who actually make it happen, and other strategies and models that I know you're incorporating as part of the work that you're doing here. So let me give you a more specific example of that. I often look at our work in CQ and people will appropriately ask the question, so where does power fit into this? Power dynamics, social justice. And I can make it fit within the model. Oh, so much of the drive is who has the power here and how do I interface with that? So much of my knowledge is am I aware of the power dynamics? My, my colleague Ratika and I, we both come from the same uh, organization and we're still both representing the same thing, but we have different levels of power in the organization. We have different uh, culturally ascribed power given to us based upon our ethnic and national backgrounds. So I think that has to be factored in and we can talk about it as part of cultural intelligence, but you could look through our materials, you could look through our assessment and you could think, that it's not there at all. So it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's an important tool that I think is a critical tool in the toolbox and is a strategic link to effective EDI work. But anyone who thinks that it alone is going to be the answer is, is going to be solely disappointed. Yeah, well, I think, you know, no model is foolproof and ultimately inclusive change, like you say, can only happen um, if we're rowing in the same direction and people take individual personal responsibility for, for um, you know, making that change to be inclusive. Um, but CQ is proven to work in terms of working and relating effectively with those who are different from you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's what you can be confident of is there's very robust peer-reviewed research that says, yeah, more than likely the way someone scores on this assessment is predictive of how they interact in a culturally diverse situation environment. Well, there you have it, the answers as to what is CQ, how it works, why this approach and so on. There is a longer version of that interview with Dave on the Reba YouTube channel. It's subtitled to, I asked him about detail that we just simply couldn't fit in here because of time. And I challenged him about using CQ in faith mission work, which can be seen as neo-colonial. So you can hear all of that by taking a look at the video at any time. If you missed any of that interview and would like to listen again, Again, you can. Reba Radio is broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place in case you can hear any background noises. But all of today's content will be repeated in four hours time right here on this link that you're listening to us now on. You're listening to Reba Radio. Real inclusive, brilliant action with Marsha Remu. And we have news about an amazing prize draw you can enter if you're a Reba member to win fantastic prizes and the beautiful inclusion poster you can get just for entering, but you need the magic word. So you're going to have to listen out for that. Uh, if you're not a member and would like to join, head over to architecture.com and hit the join the Reba button in the top right hand corner. Entering this competition is worth the membership fee alone. Hashtag honest. Uh, it's actually free for the rest of this year. So definitely worth it. And the, in the inclusion poster not only looks gorgeous, but it's got 10 top tips for inclusive practice written by. Let me just check. Oh. 
me. <laughs> it's written by me. You wouldn't want to uh, to miss what's coming up in the next hour, by the way. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramrick, the Director of Inclusion. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in the foundational behavioural principle of CQ Cultural Intelligence. Reba Radio with Marsha Remrup. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects. With me, Marsha Ramrup, I'm the Director of Inclusion here. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in the foundational behavioural principle of CQ Cultural Intelligence. And we've just spent an hour listening to Dr David Livermore of the Cultural Intelligence Centre to talking about CQ and if you've missed it don't worry you've not missed it it's all on Reba's YouTube channel and you can hear it again here later as we repeat today's live content coming up this hour what a treat we have in store the author of motherhood on the choices of being a woman and we wish we knew what to say talking to children about race and the main work we'll be speaking to her about is sway unraveling unconscious bias unconscious bias it's been a bit of a buzzword in the edi space edi equity diversity and inclusion and there are a few better people in the world to have on air talking about this so we're really lucky to have her after today's dish of the day hi my name's karma kraken i'm a path three architectural assistant at Asale architecture my dish of the day is mole poblano. It's chicken covered in a rich sauce made from chocolate, chilies, nuts, and lots of other ingredients. It really reminds me of growing up in Mexico and enjoying it with family over there. It's definitely a must try if you're ever visiting the country. Well, that sounds totally delish. Food is definitely one of the ways we can connect with each other and help us with CQ Drive. So listen out for more of those. You're listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, brilliant action. You are listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, brilliant action for architecture and the built environment. Now, one of our star guests on Reba Radio, author of Motherhood on the Choices of Being a Woman, and we wish we knew what to say, talking to children about race. And the main work we're speaking to her about is sway unravelling unconscious bias. Dr. Pragya Agarwal, welcome to Reba Radio. Hi, good morning, uh, Marsha. Lovely to be here. It's really, really great to have you with us. Uh, rather than doing a, a sort of a bio myself, I wonder if, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background as a scientist and author. Yeah, thank you. That's a tri tricky one because I never know where to start. But uh, yes, as you mentioned, um, I have had these three books come out in the last couple of years. And I am a behavioral and data scientist. I actually, my first degree was architecture back in India. And I came here to do a master's and PhD. And then um, I was an academic in US and UK universities. And then I um, went sort of freelance and um, I consultant where, and founded a research think tank called the 50% Project, where I work with a number of organizations and institutions around the world on inclusion, diversity, bias, prejudice, power, privilege, all those kind of things to make more inclusive workplaces. Um, and yes, so I'm an author, writer, consultant, scientist. Uh Pragya, we, we've spoken, we've interacted a number of times. Yes. I don't think I knew your first degree was in architecture. <laughs> I, 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 so, so tell me a little bit about that. Um, you know, what, what got you interested in architecture? So I always had these kind of two sides of the brain, uh, were artistic creative one and a scientific mathematical one. So my, my um, exam school... Uh, what you would call A-level here. I was in India. I did biology, physics, mathematics, chemistry, English, but I was also doing a lot of art on the side because I was always interested in creative activities. So I kind of um, 
It's an interesting story. I never went, wanted to, I never knew much about architecture. Nobody in my family had ever done architecture, talked about architecture. One of my friends was going to go and do the entrance exam for architecture and she didn't want to go alone. So I registered as well. <laughs> she really wanted to be an architect. And so I said, okay, I'll come with you. So I'll register for this exam. I didn't know what it would entail, all those kind of like, cognitive spatial thinking <laughs> that you're supposed to do. And I got in. So I, I suppose it was it was really fantastic result because it really balanced, um, addressed both sides of my brain, the creative aesthetic side and the mathematical scientific side. And I loved it. That's completely crazy. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. It's brilliant, but also completely mad. And I, I, I you know, um, just that sense of, you know, I'll just rock up and help my friend, you know, keep her company while she does an exam and I'll do it as well. <laughs> That's, um, oh, you're incredible, obviously incredibly intelligent and have these, all these different sides of your brain and, um, and architecture, you felt really, really pulled up all of that and, and stimulated all of that. That's uh, it's an amazing, amazing story and, and, and completely new to me, I have to say, because normally when you start doing these interviews, you think, oh, I, I know what we're going to talk about. That's that's an excellent, excellent story. And you have been hugely prolific, sort of not just clearly your several degrees, but um, you've got these three books out within, what is it, the last 18 months? Um, uh, and, and you've got another one on the way. It sounds like it's a birthing process, although I understand writing books can be a bit like that and you're so funny on twitter because uh, we all know when you should be writing but you're there tweeting and getting involved <laughs> in social justice issues it's really hard for you to stay out um all these three books they're kind of on this idea of discrimination so so how do you well how do you do it how do you how do you produce three three books in 18 months anyway i suppose there's a lot of rich material out there um we are living in one of those times where um, I mean, it's not new, racism, sexism, misogyny, bias, prejudice is not new, but I think in the last few years, we've had more conversations about it more openly. Um, there is a lot of bias, hidden bias that's come to the forefront as well because of the way we're living in the era, the political times we're living in as well. Um, what's happening here, but all around the world, uh, how polarized we are at the moment, how social media is reinforcing some of those polarizations and divisions as well. So I suppose um, that it's it's never been a better time to really talk about why we have these biases, these prejudices, um, our status, our identities are being threatened, but also our rights uh, as are being threatened as well. Uh, we are slowly moving towards a more kind of uh, autocratic rule at, at times. Um, our rights as women, our rights as people, our rights as human beings are taken away um, in some, a, a lot of occasions in lots of places more than others. So I think, um, I just think that we really need to have open conversations about it because this is really a crucial time in how we move forward um, in a more equitable manner. So you've written this book, Sway. Can you mm -hmm. actually describe what is unconscious bias? This is summarise your massive, great big book in one si one sentence. No, yes, yeah, so simply if, as as as, you, as much as you possibly can. <laughs> yes. So I I I, I think. Um, when you talk about unconscious bias, it's um, what I mean is these implicit hidden biases that we carry, um, they can manifest in surprising ways in our actions, decisions, and evaluations and judgment of people when we are not aware of them. So we might know that we are slightly prejudiced towards somebody, but we always feel like we all want to be fair-minded. We all want to be egalitarian. We all think we don't have any biases or prejudices against anybody. Um, but they manifest in, in surprising ways, like we stereotype people. So we all make sense of the world in a, in a kind of a template in homogenizing people. But when we judge somebody, we can fall back on those stereotypes, these templates. And sometimes these biases can create affinity and confirmation towards certain people so that we are swayed towards some, some decisions or some people more than others. So these are hidden implicit cognitive biases. Not all biases are negative. Some biases are we need to process information, but the biases that make us discriminate against people are the negative biases that we really need to talk about. 
And uh, the subtitle of the book, uh, Unraveling Unconscious Bias, I really loved because it's got a bit of a double meaning, hasn't it? Sort of, you know, it unravels us, um, but also you, you pull it apart. Um, mm. it, you, I, I brought into um, uh, the conversation a little bit earlier the fact that you use Twitter a lot. Uh, there's a real brevity in the format there. Do you think that there's a bit of a danger that uh, you know, we we could be making assumptions a lot from from the brevity of a format like uh, is is prevalent on Twitter. I mean, on one hand, Twitter is, and other social media platforms has made um, things more democratic in a way that not everybody has a voice, not everybody has a platform. So the in these platforms, these social media um, tools can make give people a voice in a platform those who don't have especially in the minority a lot of activism has happened through it loads of mobilization of communities has happened through it as well but on the other hand yes there is a downside as you say very rightly the the nuance is lost the brevity makes it so that often we have to sum up a kind of a uh, an argument which might be more complex in a very uh, in in a few characters so the nuance lost and we often end up being very black and white, the grays, the, the ambivalence, the ambiguities are lost sometimes, which means that there is also this tendency to fall into camps on, on Twitter and other social media platforms. Either we like this person or not, either we like this view or not. There is no way to say, I don't really know my mind just yet. Because people, it, it is an algorithm that favors likes and retweets and the way that your things are amplified. So people are, and it, it makes people addicted to that sense of wanting more likes and wanting more amplification. So people are, are perhaps sometimes more inclined to write things which would get a better response or a greater response, even though it is not really strongly that they believe in. It might be that they don't know enough about it. It might be that they don't uh, want to say, I, I am in this camp or the other camp. So I think you have to choose a side very clearly in some on the social media. So there are pros and cons. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the things that I, I think about when it comes to social media and unconscious bias is the fact that mm -hmm. you do fall into, as you describe them, these camps where your opinion's being confirmed over mm -hmm. and over again. So that confirmation bias uh, and, and that, um, it does it, I suppose the point I'm getting to is to what extent does uh, social media sort of uh, reinforce things like confirmation bias so we create a more polemic society as a result. Yeah, I mean, we know about filter bubbles and echo chambers in real world, but more so on social media, we fall into these kind of, as I said, um, group think uh, uh, in kind of we we um, have very strong divisions we might just look for information that confirms our existing belief we have affinity towards certain views and certain people it doesn't welcome this notion that okay I can follow people who don't like my views or who have diverse views because there is a very strong sense that if you like somebody who falls into the other camp then you're kind of betraying the loyalty of one camp or something so I think that the, you you can constantly hear your views being echoed back at you, which means that you are never open to diverse views or, or different views and, and actually have a reasoned, reasonable discussion at times. Um, we tend to like and tweet things or retweet things or amplify things which confirms our existing views and beliefs. And that's how the algorithm works as well. So the, these social media algorithms have also have biases built into them. They amplify, reinforce the human biases. But there's a real danger that we are really um, creating these echo chambers for us where we are getting more and more trapped into it. And, um, but, but Pragya, I'm not biased. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not biased. So, Pragya, disabuse me of that, that, that notion. So, Marsha, that's what I used to think as well. <laughs> I think all of us want to believe that, but we, we are all biased. We are human and we are all biased because we, we need, as I said, we need some of these biases or these templates or stereotypes to process information in the real world because when information is we are bombarded with information more so than with all these social media platforms but also in the real world with digital media everything we cannot our brains just don't have the capacity to process all this information on a rational manner so we make very quick 
hasty impulsive decisions from what is called the system one processing where we match the incoming information to the templates we formed in a way and we do form templates because that's how we make sense of the world we cannot have the whole mental map of the whole world we prioritize certain things we give weight to certain things we homogenize information and so we have these templates and which which are like act uh, like stereotypes so we it depends on our experiences it depends on our the way we've been brought up the communities we've lived in the tv we consume the media we consume the newspapers we read everything creates these things so we might not think that we have certain preferences or priorities but we all do that we're talking Sorry, we're talking to Dr. Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias and we'll have more from her and the kind of actions people can take and consider taking shortly. By the way, if you're listening to Reba Radio and you want to make a comment or ask a question, jump onto your socials, use the hashtag Reba Radio and if I can, I'll share your thoughts. Coming up later, we're talking about the state of inclusion in the profession today and the efforts that have been made so far, including with the founder of Architects for Change, Samita Singer OBE. And if you've missed any of the outputs so far, you can stay tuned to this link and we'll be repeating all the content later. We've already had on Dr. David Livermore talking about cultural intelligence, the background to it, why it's a useful tool and a framework right now. We're joined by the brilliant Dr. Pragya Agarwal, the author of Sway, Unraveling Unconscious Bias. We've been talking about what is unconscious bias, who's biased, everyone's biased, um, uh, Pragya, and, uh, and, and some of the ways that that manifests itself. Um, well, not so long ago, unconscious bias, I mean, it, to, to some extent it still is, you know, it's a real buzzword in the EDI world. You know, where did that come from? What was all that about? I'm trying to think back, but um, I do remember that when I started writing Sway um, way back in 2018, one of the motivations was that it was becoming um, sort of a buzzword in the business world, at least. Um, we we heard Hillary Clinton mention it during her campaign. We saw Prince Harry talk about it in Vogue, and we I was seeing more articles about it in Forbes and Harvard Business Review, especially in the business world. Um, I think that is one of the concerns that I had about how perhaps people were using it in a kind of a very tokenistic, superficial way, rather than understanding how biases are formed and how they manifest in many different ways, rather than just racism and sexism in very explicit manner. Um, and I just wanted to address it from a very interdisciplinary perspective that these biases are formed, how they're formed in our brain, how they manifest in very different ways without us realizing and what impact it has on society and individuals. So uh, I, I've had a one-off training course, Pragya. I spent two hours talking about unconscious bias. I'm fixed, am I not? Did you get a certificate, Marcia? Because I think that's <laughs> I think I did. That really... I think I did get a certificate. <laughs> so now you're absolved of all responsibility, all bias. I don't think it works like that, unfortunately. Sorry to be bringing the bad news. But, <laughs> but um, I don't think we can really completely erase or eradicate biases or any unconscious bias, because as I said, some of these cognitive biases are there to process information, the way we work in the world. If I want to go and buy cereal today, I can't stand there for the whole day weighing up the pros and cons in a very rational manner of each cereal. I will fall back on some of my previous biases and preferences and, and experiences and memories of why a particular cereal works better in my family and not. Or for instance, if I go and buy an ice cream, I have a particular preference for it. But these kind of biases don't have any negative uh, really kind of impact unless the other ice creams feel bad about it or <laughs> feel that they are discriminated against. But, uh, but in terms of humans, when we are making these decisions, some, some of these, these biases or previous experiences or the what we sometimes tend to call our gut instinct even which is not a gut instinct because that's also falling back on some of our previous experiences and these kind of things that have been built up these these data bank um, can really have huge impact especially in some of if you're making really critical decisions like in the healthcare domain or in a criminal justice domain or even um, in um, in hiring or recruitment and and I think they they can lead to Preferring, preferring somebody who we have more affinity with or who we feel more aligned with than other 
rather than an objective evaluation of mm. the situation. Mm. And, uh, well, see it here next, uh, bias ice cream coming your way. Um, I, I, one of the, the, the references I tend to make is um, a couple of years ago, a group of academics, Forsha Lai et al., they aggregated into one um, 492 studies on whether unconscious bias awareness one-off interventions worked. And there were like 90,000 participants uh, with that aggregation. And what they discovered with that uh, research was that um, what you think might change a little bit, but what you did doesn't really. And, and so they, uh, certainly um, Calvin Lai, one of the authors behind that report, suggested that you shouldn't try, you shouldn't try to change your bias. You need to do other things. What, what are some of those other things that people need to think about doing? Yeah, very rightly. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, there's no specific tool that we really have to change our bias or to, to train ourselves out of implicit biases. Even the one that everybody tends to use, the implicit association test, it was never meant to really train people out of biases. What it does is works on, very simplistically speaking, it works on associations. So if I say apple to you, would you think red or green? Those are the kind of associations we, we make in real life between concepts. So that is what it highlights, what we have association with. When we think of a black man, do we think of a criminal more than white man? Those are some of the associations people have built up and that leads to discriminatory attitudes. And so even I spoke with Calvin Lai when I did wrote a, a piece for New Scientist last year for in August uh, about whether these kind of tools or training works or not. And yes, it, it doesn't. What it does, it highlights some of the biases that you, it might have, but it also very contextual and people can learn how to play these tools as well. So you can ace the test, so to speak, if you take it again and again. Um, what happens is that in the first instance, people get aware of, become aware of these biases. So it might feel like we are becoming more biased because they are reinforcing some of the biases we have, which we didn't know of before because of the associations we we, we see on the screen. Um, and that is the first stage of, of actually being uncomfortable because people don't like to be uncomfortable. Our brains don't like to be uncomfortable. So we tend to kind of ignore that often or people might say, oh, we are aware of it, but I, I don't think I have that anymore or I'll work on it or, or, or things like that. And so we tend to go back into the more comfortable stage, um, rush back to it without actually taking the time to reflect on why we carry these associations, what we can do about it. So there are lots of other things we can do, which is reflective listening, which is critical thinking, which is being more aware of our situation and surroundings, educating ourselves, reflection and empathy and trying to understand that people have different mental models of the world and different perspectives. And all these things take time. There's no quick fix like taking a one hour or two hours test. So often people think, give me a quick fix to get rid of my unconscious bias. But it doesn't work like that. It mm -hmm. has to be an ongoing process because our mindset takes time to change and rewire in a way um, these, these associations. So once we become aware, we can put a gap between holding the stereotypes and activating the stereotypes, but it takes time. And um, really, crucially, of course, cultural intelligence does help with <laughs> this. Um, I myself took the IAT um, test, the impl implicit association test, which anybody can do by um, going to, I think it's a Harvard, uh, it's a Harvard website. And so yes. just Google it, IAT Harvard. And um, I, I actually wasn't surprised, but I, I, I did age. I, well, I did a, a lot of them, and I also did race. And I wasn't surprised that even though I'm, I'm a woman of color myself, I'm from an underrepresented racialized group. I was preferenced moderately towards white people. So it doesn't mean that just because you come from an underrepresented group that you are um, biased towards that group in any, any way or form. Uh, why, why would that have been? Why, why would I have come out in that way? Because we have to think about how these systemic and structural hierarchies in our society have existed for a very long time. We are deeply rooted in this, embedded in this. We internalize some of these messages. So yes, whiteness is a norm in our society. Male or masculinity is a norm in our society. So we also internalize these messages 
that this is better. And I know that within underrepresented minority ethnic community, colorism exists as well, where because of the long history of imperialism and colonialism, we have internalized these messages that fair skinned is more beautiful or superior, <clears throat> which means that we, we can actually be biased against people of darker skin as well within our communities. As, and there is a lot of research to show that. So, so unconscious bias can be externalized, but also internalized, which doesn't mean that we cannot be biased against our own community because we can believe in these messages that men are better or, or a white skin is better or more superior. Um, and women can show bias against other women as well. And it's been proven through research as well. Similarly, darker skinned or minority mm. ethnic people can also believe that proximity to whiteness can give them more opportunities in life. Mm, really interesting. So how, so that those IATs, it's one way of measuring. Uh, is it useful to measure our unconscious bias? And it, apart from the IATs, like, is there anything else we can do to, to bring those out of ourselves? I think um, people do like, the, especially businesses and organizations sometimes like having these quantifiable things like scores. So I used to be 1.2 and now I'm 0.9 or 0.5. So I reduced my bias. But as I said, these are not really reliable measures. What is it? Sh it's showing you is that in this particular moment, when you were sitting here right now, you did a test or an on-screen associative things, and this is what you came up with. That doesn't mean that if you did it in a different context and different mindset, if you were more rushed or distracted or in a hurry, or you'd been primed with some other information. So for instance, if you saw a negative media report about um, a black man uh, being a criminal or, or somebody, a terrorist incident, which shows a darker skin person um, doing something violent, then you're primed with that information and that can impact how you take these tests or respond to some of these answers. So it's all very contextual. And, and yes, people do like these quantifiable measures, but there is no measure for how we hold these these impressions in our mind about our attitudes and beliefs. All we can go by is how we respond to real world information and what decisions we make. So um, in terms of things like that, those uh, unconscious bias, they have a real world impact, don't they? Yes. Some of those things about seeing black people and saying that they're, they're criminals. Um, how, how do we overcome that as a society even? Yeah, I mean, it's a big question. And <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, but, you know, we have to, we have to start somewhere. I think the more we become aware that, yes, the way that media represents some of the information and the messages we get around us, it's like a smog that exists and we are constantly absorbing these messages. So I give an example uh, about after, the, after Hurricane Katrina, there were two news articles that came out quite um, close by. One showed a photograph of a black man, a uh, young black man wading through flood water. And the headline said, a, a man um, wades through flood water after looting a grocery store. And there was another photograph that came out with two white people, similar situation in the flood waters. And it said two people find bread and soda or find after finding bread and soda in the, in the grocery mm -hmm. store. And the journalist actually admitted that they had no idea of the context or what had happened before, whether somebody had looted or found it. But the, just that word can reinforce some of the biases that people have or create new biases by people thinking actually black men loot and white people find. And so that's a very simple example, but a powerful example of how the words and images around us can can create these biases and stereotypes. So it's always around us and we have to rethink in a way, our, our kind of rewire the way we think about society. And we need to think about wh how, what is our perception of these hierarchies in society? Who is at the top and who's at the bottom? Mm -hmm. And this starts from a very young age. And that's why we need to start talking to our children about systemic and structural hierarchies and biases and prejudices from a young age, even though we might think these are very complex topics. 
You're listening to Reba Radio with me, Marsha Ramroop, Director of Inclusion for the RIBA, bringing you 28 hours of content to help architecture on its journey towards better inclusion. I'm speaking to the author and scientist, Dr. Pragya Agarwal, about unconscious bias. Coming up later today, we have my soundtrack. My soundtrack is a music hour hosted by a series of special guests. Today we have Rita Ray, the singer and broadcaster. She has some banging tunes to share. So listen in between 5 and 6 p.m. You know, I'm going to have to call this out. <laughs> I literally just ran to the toilet <laughs> and now I'm a little bit out of breath um, because there was two minutes left on the track and literally had to go run. And my colleague here has gone to get me some tea. I did wash my hands. You have to stop and wash your hands for 20 seconds. <laughs> Who knew that COVID would mean that I'd be out of breath for this? Oh, wow. Gosh, anyway, it's real life. Real live radio, ladies and gents. Earlier, we had on Dr. David Livermore calling about, uh, talking about cultural intelligence and the background to do it, to it, why it's a useful tool, the framework. If you missed it, well, you actually haven't missed it, as it's the full subtitle video uh, will be up on the Reba YouTube channel, and that will be within the next 24 hours. And you can listen again right here, as we'll be repeating all of this content. But now, back to our discussion on unconscious bias with the author and scientist, Dr. Pragya Agarwal, author, scientist and architecture trained, which we discovered a little bit earlier. Um, we've heard about what it is and uh, what actions, uh, you know, that th are useful around it. Um, what, what do we, what can, in what way can we really hope to see change? Because how effective really can we be at changing our bias? I think we have to understand that our biases manifest in many different ways. So for instance, just as a simple example, um, uh, we might be, we might have a status bias. We might think that certain people, certain writers, certain architects are, are, are much better than others because, because, because just the way we, we've seen society. And once we, start associating status with somebody or a person or a community, then we create a halo bias around them, which means that we only think about their positive attributes all the time. So which architects do we read about? Which architects do we consider a, a kind of milestone landmark uh, people in, 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 in art history or architecture history? Which, um, which books do we read? Which authors do we consider important? Which authors do we teach? Which architects do we teach when we're talk, talking, um, teaching? So all that, how we design our curriculum can also have biases in, built in them, which we are reinforcing by passing on that information, which means that certain pre people or certain groups of people are, are marginalized or othered or not given as much significance. So we can start very small as well. We can start in our everyday about the books we buy, the, the TV we consume, the media we consume, we, we also get our book recommendations and TV recommendations and Netflix recommendation from our echo chambers, which means that everybody's just talking about the same people. And that can also reinforce this kind of the majority um, uh, status and also how we know that Global South authors from Global South or writers or architects or uh, can also be marginalized because of that. Mm. So I, I think everything that we do, we can reflect on why we are giving more importance to a certain thing or a certain person than the other. Is it something that is that we, we don't, we can't explain? Can we not rationalize that decision? Can we say, oh, it was just an instinct or a first impression, or is it because it's always been done like this? All those kind of things can be based in our biases or these legacy of biases that we built in. So I think every change matters, every little thing, every conversation that we have matters. Um, in hiring and recruitment, for instance, we can think about how we can remove groupthink. When we hire people, are we hiring for workplace culture or workplace fit? Because that also reinforces this idea that there are only certain kinds of people who would fit into this workplace, which means that we are only hiring people who look like us or think like us or act like us. Um, I mean, it's a, such a big conversation about 
what we can do, but also diversity and inclusion are two very different things. We can have a very diverse workplace, but we might not have a very inclusive workplace, which means that not everybody has the same sense of belonging. Not everybody can be their complete selves. They have to adapt their hair, their clothes, their behavior, their mannerisms, their accent to fit in. That is not inclusivity. Inclusivity is where everybody has a right to be themselves and everybody feels a strong sense of belonging to their workplace organization society community so I think all those kind of things when we start thinking about it is about changing our values and ethos and being very explicit about it um, and it's it's about saying we value inclusivity not just diversity mm. and all the, a lot of those things that you spoke about there inclusive recruitment architectural education uh that decolonization if you like of the curricula yeah. uh, all of those things uh we will be talking about on on reba radio over the next 20 28 well 26 hours now uh, as, as as we go through our, our programming uh, so you know watch out for that um you mentioned a little bit earlier about about AI um, and as technology uh, technology changes and we, we turn to AI you know how can how is that really going to play out in our in our world do you think yeah I mean I, I wrote a lot about it in in Sway and I'm this is something I'm really interested in because that's my background about human-centered AI and effective computing and technologies and how we make things more usable um, and in that also, we take certain things as a norm. So technology or data is built around a norm. And it is also a matter of power and privilege. Who builds these systems and who are they designed for? Who collects this data? Where is the data collected? Whose data is collected and represented? That will get, that will create the norm in the technology. So we, what we have to understand is these technologies are embedded in our society, so they're never free from biases. The data that machine learning algorithm is trained on has biases inbuilt in them. Uh, the technology that's designed by the teams have biases, of course. So if the teams are not very diverse, um, they're mainly middle-class white men, then that will go into the technology and system. And we need know that from not just AI systems, but in like everyday systems and technology as well. So yes, we've heard a lot about racism in facial uh, recognition technology. I wrote an article for Prospect. I have some things in Sway as well. Um, and I know that now that organizations in the last year, especially after George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter has have reevaluated that and have actually banned, some of the organizations have banned it. But, um, but we know that even like, um, um, soap dispensers don't recognize dark skin as effectively so they are racist soap dispenser I have a video in one of my talks um, and we know that automated cars um, don't recognize darker skin pedestrians so they are more likely to run over darker skin pedestrians we know that when I went to get a passport photo taken in one of the photo booths it kept on saying um, your mouth is open and you're smiling. And I wasn't, I was just sitting there in the, my worst, saddest, most melancholic face in the world with my mouth <laughs> closed. But it, it's so all these things. It. Wow. Yeah. And also we know that the UK passport website has had problems that they doesn't recognize darker skin uh, photographs. It always keeps saying the error is that, we, that there are no edges. So these are very simple examples of how everyday technology can other people and marginalize people because it's built around a certain norm, a normative value. So of course it is, is going to have a huge impact. Uh, and these are very simple examples, but then they're bigger examples like in criminal justice system, people are ranked according to the previous offenses in America, there was a system being used about whether they're high risk or low risk. And it was found that they were classifying darker skinned black people as more high risk, even if they didn't have as big offenses in the past as, as white men. So, so all this data goes by history and how the data is being trained on. And, and so, so, it, it really affects, it can have small term impact, long term impact and bigger impacts like in criminal justice system or healthcare, who's being diagnosed, who's being treated, what kind of medication they are being given, but also in, in everyday uh, systems and technologies that we use as well. So I think we really need to examine um, how we design these sy systems and technology 
whose data is being collected, which data is being collected, what are the teams like, um, and the notion of power and privilege, I think, is really, really important. Mm. Being able to stop and slow yeah. down and consider those questions are going to be really quite key to the way that we actually move forward and take those next steps, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, what do you say to those who use unconscious bias as an excuse for their discriminatory behaviour? <laughs> I, I don't think we can justify it or excuse it. Um, we are responsible for our actions and that's the first step to be accountable, to be responsible, to acknowledge that, yes, I might have bias. And to also not think of our intent, because often we can excuse things by saying, oh, actually, I don't have any in, I didn't have any intent or I didn't mean it like that. And I also feel like people take offense at being called a racist or sexist and that becomes a bigger thing than the impact is had on some people. So my slogan always is we need to think about the impact rather than the intent. We need to think about the impact it's having on other people. And I think the moment we start doing that, we build more empathetic connections and, and, and create a non-judgmental space where we can really evaluate our attitudes and beliefs. We're, we're really lucky to have you because you, you had a book deadline, uh, which was Monday, <laughs> I think. Uh, did you make it? Yes, I did. Okay. I sent it, but fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, it was a huge, I feel almost human again. <laughs> so <laughs> are, are you able to say what, it, what it's about? Um, it is about gender inequality, but more will be revealed very soon and hope we can talk about it soon. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pragya Agwal. It's been really rich. I know I could spend a lot, a lot of time um, talking to you. And you and I have got a plan, haven't we, to um, try to look at uh, the word race and the way it's defined in the dictionary. So uh, that's that's going to be hopefully something that we can we can do together. Thank you so much to Dr. Pragya Agarwal. Um, if you would like any of Pragya's books, by the way, head over to the Reba Bookshop webpage. There's a special Reba radio section uh, with a discount uh, all the authors and the themes associated with our broadcast you can find it on there as well coming up later we'll be talking about the state of inclusion in the profession today and the efforts that have been made so far including with the founder of architects for change Samita Singer OBE <laughs> Take a chance. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize draw. We have two fabulous prizes to give away. A, a win a two night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses. They're uniquely designed. They're funky luxury retreats. They include things uh, for a pampering stay like hot tubs, saunas, cargo net day beds suspended over a stream beneath an oak canopy and wood burning stoves if it's chilly <laughs> sounds amazing doesn't it the tree houses are a perfect place to escape and get away from it all and the second prize win tickets to see the specials live their show next july in dublin sold out ages ago but we've managed to secure two tickets for our lucky winners plus a night stay at a hotel of your choice in dublin up to the value of 200 pounds and that's saturday the 2nd of july 2022 at trinity college dublin to enter the draw this is where you really need to listen carefully go to the reba radio webpage on architecture.com and just fill in the form and the magic word you need is giraffe. The magic word is giraffe. I don't know if you have to spell it correctly, but put it in anyway. The winners will be announced live during the last Reba radio broadcast on Friday the 26th of November. Plus, each entry will receive a limited edition booklet that folds out into a beautiful poster. A must for your office wall, absolutely. Full terms and conditions can be found on architecture.com. Uh, that poster has 10 top tips for inclusion. 10 top tips. 10 top. I've got to really practice that. 10 top 
tips for inclusion. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects. With me, Marsha Ramroop, I'm the Director of Inclusion here. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything that you do. And it's all rooted in the foundational behavioural principle of CQ Cultural Intelligence. We've already talked CQ, we've already talked unconscious bias, now we're going to talk inclusion in architecture. Woohoo! Well, it's my reason for being, it's the reason for my job, so I'm totally, totally up for this. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects. With me, Marsha Ramroop, I'm the Director of Inclusion here. We're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. It's all rooted in the foundational behavioural principle of CQ, cultural intelligence. Earlier, we heard from Dr. David Livermore of the Cultural Intelligence Centre talking about CQ, then Dr. Pragya Agarwal, the author of Motherhood on the Choices of Being a Woman. We wish we knew what to say talking to children about race, but the main work we spoke to her about was Sway, Unravelling Unconscious Bias. If you missed it, don't worry, you've not missed it. It's all to be subtitled and on the Reba's YouTube channel, and you can hear it again here later as we repeat today's live content. If you hear me talking about EDI, EDI is equity, diversity and inclusion, and I'm going to break those down for you as well. Coming up this hour, we're talking about the Reba Inclusion Charter with two active and dynamic Reba members. Uh, what's happened since it launched last year, what expectations we can have from those commitments in the profession and why they're so important. Hello, this is DJ Rita Ray. Tune into my soundtrack on Reba Radio today at 5 p.m. It's all about celebrating diversity and inclusion with tracks from Arlo Parks, Erin and Wallen, T.Y., Jazz Jamaica, just to name a few. See you there. Well, I'm delighted to welcome to Reba Radio now Yemi Aludaran and Mariam Alihrim to speak about the Reba Inclusion Charter. And I'd just like to give a shout out to Angela Dapper from Grimshaw. She was supposed to be joining us today, but she's not well. And it's a real shame because I know that Grimshaws are doing great work around inclusion. So get well soon, Angela. But uh, Yemi and Mariam, I always think it better rather than me telling people who you are uh, to hear from you who who you say you are <laughs> and um and and what what do you do or have done with the riba if i can go to you first mariam hi everyone uh my name is mariam i'm the current vice president for students and associates at the riba so i'm a student representative at the riba i try and champion students voices in the riba council I used to sit on education, I sit on architecture for change and try and provide a student perspective um, to, I guess, diversity as, as well as I sit on um, the Future Architects Steering Group. Um, yeah. Thank you. And, and you're not actually in, in the UK at the moment, are you? No, I'm not. Uh, so at the moment I'm in the UAE, I was just doing a, a talk for Cityscape, but I'm coming back maybe next week <laughs> excellent oh, it's great to, it's great that you can join us and yemi so tell us a little bit about you and 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 uh, what have you done and or are doing with the riba oh, fantastic thank you lovely 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 to be here um so yes yemi aladarin i am an architect and uh, development manager currently working on the meridian water scheme for enfield council i have sat on um on council on rba council from 2017 to 2020 as a national council member i also sat on education committee with um mariam and also sit on the education group as well well, thanks so much indeed for that. It gives us a, a bit of context as to, to who you are. And uh, I'm really actually curious if I could start with you, Yemi. Uh, why? Why do you get involved as a member of the uh, as, of the RIBA? Because there, there are loads of members out there who, who, you know, happy to be a member, but maybe not be so active. So what propels you to do it? 
Yeah, well, to, to be absolutely honest, pre-2017, I was not involved with the RIBA. It was um, then President Ben Derbyshire that was doing a tour as part of getting um, the, the presidency, going around to um, talk to practices, large, small, all around the country about um, why people were not engaging with the RIBA. And there was a real call to action there and um, I was taken by a lot of what he he was saying and actually it all it all, it all kind of snowboarded um from from there and kind of wanting to be part of the change that um um yeah that that he said was needed and he wanted to bring bring about and um yeah, so since then, I, I've just been drawn in the web of the RIBA, and it's. I think it's. We all have to put our shoulder to the wheel if we want a better profession, um, and yeah, so that that's why I do what I do and interact with the RIBA. Thank you. I mean, Mariam, you, you, you know, as VP of, of students, um, you know, th there's a very particular calling, presumably, that you feel you have. To be honest, when. What I was thinking when I first ran, at first I didn't really think I would run. It's like, oh, me, you know. And then I was doing a bit of like student representation at um, a small university up in the Northwest called University Central Lancashire. And that's where I originally ran. And I just kind of had this urge of like, you know, there needs to be some sort of change in the architectural education, at least in terms of like the way the culture is uh, being undertaken. And I kind of felt like, um, when I saw this position for three years, I thought, well, if I don't run, then who's going to run? You know, who's going to who's going to bring about this change? And I really wanted to bring about at least some positive change, just so other people wouldn't have to, uh, let's just say, the hard lessons learned in architecture school, maybe not repeated at least. Um, I'm still studying at the moment, but I really wanted to bring about some sort of positive difference. And I felt that uh, I mean, even to have the opportunity to run as a student representative is really great from the RIBA so that they are listening to their younger members, which are the future of the profession as well. Well, I mean, one of the, the things that um, the RIBA have, has tried to do is with this inclusion charter. And as you may know, I started in this role in February and seeing the charter was one of the reasons I applied for this role because um, uh, it was like signalling intent around inclusion. And if we can go through it. So the first thing is a responsibility to influence. It's calling on architects and the built environment professionals to pledge support for equity and inclusion. And by signing the charter, practices and individuals acknowledge the urgent need for inclusion in the architecture profession and wider construction industry. Um, Mariam, to what extent do you feel that acknowledgement has been properly embraced? I think when in the beginning, when the Black Lives Matter movement was first starting up, um, there was a lot of conversation that was in the early pandemic everyone really wanted a kind of to rise to the betterment of society. And I felt that um, that conversation has a little bit died down. That conversation has died down a little bit, but however, I feel that at least in architecture, there's a lot to go forward. There's, you know, this change I think has been, is much needed. Uh, unfortunately, architecture has some ugly roots and it's built in on kind of a very male, quite male oriented view. You know, even the RIBA at one point was, you know, a males only club. There was no such thing as female architects. So I think now in the 21st century, we have to really be aware of these structural dynamics that have taken place and kind of remember that as a society, we've progressed so much and we should really be vocal about it and acknowledge that these previous biases that maybe our ancestors had, um, that we no longer carry them or at least try to not um, have the same views. And I think that's why we have to raise awareness and kind of be vocal and say it and also actually do it. So, you know, transparency is really key and showcasing mm -hmm. data. You know, when someone goes on someone's website, um, you know, a lot of students, when they go to a practice, they want to see people who look like them a little bit. They want to see a bit of diversity. They'll just look at your company profile. They'll look at who's working there. You know, is there anyone who looks like me? Does this company, you know, even employ someone who's like me? Whether their skin color, their belief, or just even if they're just a little bit different. Uh, I think um, that's something that students really look for nowadays. Mm. 
Yeah, Yemi, I saw you nodding along there. Yeah, I, I think um, just kind of to add to what Maroon said, I think it's also important if we set, set out some context in terms of the um, inclusion charter, because I think the, the inclusion charter is part of kind of uh, a series of bits of work that has been done by the RIB to get us to, to where we are now. So as I say, Mariam and I, um, both um, uh, sitting on the education committee, we both strongly pushed the point of access to the profession for underrepresented groups and also retention. Um, I, I also am one of five co-founders of Paradigm Network, and that's a profession or uh, network um, for the construction industry, for those who are passionate about increasing kind of black and Asian representation within the built environment. And touching a little bit more specifically on the work of the education committee, I think what I'm most part, uh, proud of was the social mobility paper that I worked really closely on with the then president, um, Alan Jones and other RIBA collaborators and kind of the paper puts together recommendations and social inclusion during on the social mobility commission report. Um, and this um, puts into an overarching policy and was approved by council and w is shaping the work of the RIBA going forward. And that touches on the, um, that's part of kind of what we're pushing with the inclusion charter. I also think it's important to talk about the work of the president's fact finding mission. Um, so I was one of eight champions tasked to consider crucial themes um, and those were diverse, diversity, inclusion, practice, knowledge, values, um, I mean, so many things, but it really sets out a future landscape of how architects will survive and thrive and how the RIBA needs to evolve and how practices and academia can, can come together to better challenge and support each other. And what we explain in my chapter is the importance of reflecting the diversity of the population within mm. the architectural workforce by adopting reforms and policies that promote diversity and inclusion within um, business practices. So I think the in inclusion part um, charter is part of a kind of web of work, the RI, it hasn't come from nowhere. It's part of lots of fantastic work that the RIBA has been doing. And I think it pulls all of that um, together and touches on some of the points Mariam raised as well. I just thought it was important to give kind of Absolutely. Some, some context. Absolutely. And and uh, alongside that acknowledgement and the work wider that's being done at the RIBA, out, out in practice, is, is there, do you see that commitment to set targets and create action plans around, around practice? I yeah. think um, we, we're seeing with those that have kind of signed up to the inclusion chart, I think that that's a, that's a big um, yes. Um, but there's still lot, lots of people that I think are struggling to know exactly what to do and, and how we um, and how we do it. But I think it is really important that targets are set, because if you don't set targets, then you're not able to a really um, be aware of the issue. Uh, that then means you're not able to monitor progress. Uh, targets mean accountability. <laughs> and more importantly, I think it all those kind of targets um, to be really effective, they need to be written into kind of policy and process and reviewed regularly to, to really have the meaningful change that we're, we're seeking. Mariam, I mean, I, I, I have a slightly different take on targets in that I feel that targets are important as long as you've got the data to know what you're targeting and how much as well. So there's a bigger piece around data. Um, I mean, how much have you seen, seen the, the right kind of collection uh, of data, Mariam? I think, you know, data is an interesting one. Um, you know, it's being collected regardless whether people have given consent or not. But however, there is this one element that really um, I see is that there's a lot of um, talking about inclusion, which is great. However, we're not seeing really the action there. Some practices would just like to be noticed that they're inclusive. However, when it comes to actual employment or hiring, or, you know, you put pen to paper, how inclusive are you? You know, you have to, I think, um, I think part of what makes this kind of hard is that you almost have to reflect on yourself or society has to almost advocate for it. So it's not only enough that um, as one practice, it's also the people in the practice, they have to be accountable to each other. You have to have these uncomfortable conversations with your colleagues, 
Um, in the RIB Northwest, you know, uh, the, I think we try to kind of bridge about different conversations and just trying to hear from other people's perspectives. And I think that's just a start. Mm. Um, when a practice says they're inclusive, I think we have to start asking, what do you mean by that? It's not a marketing ploy anymore. We want to see actual accountability in action. And when you say you are inclusive, we want to see, you know, it's not just that picnic barbecue with everyone out there and then that's being posted on social media. No, we want something that's genuine. We want to see different, you know, supporting different employees from different backgrounds. Let's start from young people to older people from different backgrounds you know, being aware of the different cultural shifts or just as well as being mindful, really. It's just about respect at the end of the day. We're not all the same, but I think that's what makes it so beautiful. And it's even like shown that um, companies that have more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenue, you know? So even when it comes to business, we have to remember diversity actually makes more money. We'll hear more from Yemi and uh, Miriam uh, talking about the inclusion charter. If you go to rebabooks.com, Reba Radio, forward slash Reba Radio, all the books and authors and themes covered around diversity and inclusion appearing on air, you can find there. You can get hold of their work at a discount. Uh, you can come into the bookshop here too and pick up copies. Also, Dr. David Livermore, when he was here recording, he signed his copies of Leading with Cultural Intelligence. So check that out. If you missed hearing any of our outputs so far, I was speaking to David Livermore earlier about CQ, Pragya Agrawal about unconscious bias. And you can hear all of that again as we repeat our output as live. Yemi uh, Aladaran and Miriam Al-Irhim, they're speaking to me now about the REBA Inclusion Charter. Uh, we've spoken a bit about acknowledgement and commitment and some of those points you were making there, Mariam, um, just before we went to the track, Yemi, you were you were nodding away, nodding away. A lot of a lot of commitment and and action uh, and visibility needed, not just around having nice pictures, but actual action. Um, and 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 this is the inclusion charter helping that because we've got a couple more commitments here about developing workplace culture, talent pipeline, and um, you know that those those ways of working. Uh, how can how can practices do that, and what do you want to see from them? I think it's good, very good question. And again, it kind of um, there was a lovely segue there from Miriam that it left left off which was based basically that you know performative allyship will get us nowhere there, there's really no substitute to doing the hard work yes it's about fairness and doing the right thing but um you know Maram touched on something very very importantly which is that there's an economic imperative too as well and we live we live in a very competitive world and in a knowledge-based economy and we simply can't afford to waste talent and there is definitely therefore a business imperative to ensure sustainability of the architectural profession. I think our traditional business models and learning make, uh, models favour the few and, and not the many and this has been proven to be inherently unsustainable, unjust and economically unproductive. So um, it, it's really, really important that if we are uh, as a profession trying to create futures in which a wide range of people can thrive, we need to all accept that we have blind spots and biases and, and whether intended or not um, affect our outlook and decision making processes. So. You know, although let's not be, be fooled in the last 20 months, yes, there's been lots of um, kind of conversation and nagging the drum about inclusion and kind of diversity and a wide range of things. But there are lots of people that still, to be honest, don't don't really care because it doesn't directly impact them. So there is still a lot of work to, to be done. So I think the inclusion charter is great. We need to continue to get more and more architects sign, signed up to that and practices signed up to that so that we can um, yeah, start to really implement change and for it not just to be t another tick box exercise. Yeah, really interesting point because I was talking to David Livermore about, about this, this um, driver, the extrinsic interest of the fact that um, the bottom line of business is that you you are you know eight times more innovative and have better business outcomes if you 
do you have not only a diverse team because it's it's all well and good bringing in a diversity of staff but you have to also then have that inclusive culture where people feel that their values needs um, are, are respected and, and taken into account because otherwise actually if you're hiring for diversity but you don't have that culture and you're expecting people who are different from you just to fit in that's not going to work and that there are two outcomes one is they leave and the second is they stay but they become very unhappy to the point sometimes of of mental uh, uh, ill health so um, really really important to get that right but it, I always talk about we need to lead with inclusion and manage diversity so um, you know that that idea about publicly reporting on progress around an EDI plan transparency I heard a word that you used there as well Mariam a little bit earlier accountability a, a, a word you're both using they're vital to driving cultural change that's a that's a commitment that people make when they sign up w what are you seeing of that thus far go for it Yemi <laughs> Gosh, I, oh, that's an interesting one. I'm not, I, I can't really speak a, across the, the profession on what um, out, outcomes are, I guess, in terms of maybe take, taking it to uh, Paradigm Network, because we've partnered with um, some kind of really like-minded and fantastic architectural practices, which reached out to, and some were already um, pre Kind of, we we founded in 2017 and we have some practices that even since then have partnered with us to to work and change change things um but we have seen a, a you know quite a few more partner over the last kind of two two years and for those um practices that we're working closely with trying to see we're starting to see real positive change and things not being tick box exercise and creating you know and the realization like as you touched on Marsha that it's not just about um getting more diverse people in is about, about creating inclusive workplaces where people can thrive prosper and stay yeah. <laughs> retention retention also is, is a big thing so there's a whole kind of i think um pipeline that we need to to work within so yeah so th there are some practices that, that are kind of um kind of taking the lead and doing fantastic work but it's still at, at also, also I should mention at all different scales as well so it's not just the big practices they're smaller um, practices also realizing that things need to be um, done and actioning things um, positively. Mariam you, you had a bit of a rueful smile on your face uh, you know when, when I was talking about the progress around the, a transparent EDI plan you haven't seen that. Um, I would say, I mean, it's, we have to commend who's people who are doing work. And I think we do always have to say, someone's done something well, you know, why don't we have, for example, the most inclusive practice award? We always talk about buildings, but we're not talking about culture, are we? What is the best workplace culture? People nowadays really care about where they work. You know, when people see those cool images of the Google office with the slides and the I don't know, the really weird lunch breaks, people start they, saying, that's a kind of quirky environment that I want to be in. It's a lifestyle. And I think that's really what companies have to start thinking about. I think now after COVID, nobody wants to work in your just normal office and sit there and not interact with anyone. You know, architecture is all about collaboration. And I just think that at least from a younger perspective, I just, I feel like the numbers aren't really showcasing that. You know, at the moment, the trend is that most students who are from a BAME background uh, dramatically decrease when they get to their part three. And that's really something that's, you know, that's what Yemi was talking about, retention. So that means maybe it's more difficult to get a job. You know, maybe when you see a different name on a CV, you start, you know, instead of judging them by their character and their work, you're judging them by their name. I think, you know, even CVs and the way that we um, hire people is, is something that we have to think about. I mean, how are we sure we're hiring the best person if, you know, your mate recommended him and that was it? You know, you, you didn't even give an opportunity for others. Or at least if you're going to, you know, you want the best person for the job, then, you know, maybe have a blind CV, you know, push the limit a little bit. You know, I think it's up to companies to 
put the benchmark of where they want to be uh, and how inclusive they want to be. And if they truly are fair and want to give everyone an equal opportunity, then do it through, you know, when you're doing a job, uh, you know, where are you putting your job adverts? Is it just on certain one website? Are you doing it? Is it everywhere? I mean, maybe you just made like one social media post. Are you going to all the right architecture schools? Or are you just going to like one? Mm -hmm. And then that's it. You're just hoping that somebody from that collegiate school, regardless, is there. I mean, I think, you know, there to an extent, people have their own responsibility and they can, they need to ask themselves, am I being diverse enough? Am I including everyone? How can I do more? And I think we can always do more. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're not going to hear any any dispute from me on, on that. And um, one thing that uh, I, I want to sort of maybe um, articulate is that one of the reasons why we're running Reba Radio is it's really clear that, that these commitments are really great and um, it's great to see the intentions uh, behind it. But uh, at the RIBA, we know that we can do more to support practices and members to be able to fulfill these commitments. So some of those things you're talking about there around inclusive recruitment and architectural education and looking at some of the issues within both of those are things that we're going to start pulling apart on Reba Radio just as a first step to help people think about what they need to think about uh, when it comes to what they need to be doing when it comes to being inclusive. And there's a, another commitment here around embedding inclusive design in all practices, but we'll come to that shortly. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Yemi and um, Mariam about the principles and actions that can be taken. We've invited seven special guests from the worlds of architecture, design, arts and culture to prepare and present pre-recorded music hour being broadcast between 5 and 6 p.m. each day. Uh, our guest presenters, they're going to share personal stories, unique insights uh, reflected by their choice in top tunes. Tippity top tunes coming your way uh, across the musical spectrum. So today it's Rita Ray. She's a broadcaster, curator, performer, a DJ with a keen focus on African music. And Rita actually presented the African Music Review on BBC World Service. She's a regular contributor to the Arts Hour, um, plus the station's flagship Global Beat series. She researched, she presented uh, the acclaimed three part documentary on African music, Africa, a journey into music for BBC4 TV. So we're super, super lucky to have her doing my soundtrack tonight between 5 and 6 pm. Earlier, I was speaking to Dr. Pragya Agrawal about bias, and she had some great advice about how to take the time to mitigate it. And when you add on uh, what Dr. David Livermore was saying about CQ strategy, it really is a great start to your inclusion journey. But right now, we're talking to Yemi Aladaran and Mariam al Irhim. They're Reba members, and they've been speaking about the inclusion charter. Um, Yemi, um, this this final commitment here. Uh, you, you're currently uh, in project management with um, Meridian Water. That's correct, isn't it? Um, yeah. That's and, uh, you know, th th there is a commitment here to embed inclusive design into all projects and contributing to the development of inclusive environments. Uh, I know um, Peter George across the Meridian really pushing hard on the procurement side to make sure that when engaging practices, uh, that is really, really taken into account. Can you tell me a little bit about that work? Yeah, I mean, it was some really, really fantastic work Pete, Peter's been doing there and kind of going against the grain of what normally what, what you would see. Again, maybe a, a little bit of context, kind of in terms of um, when we talk about who's currently designing our cities, I think latest figures show that about 30% of all architects registered in the UK are women. Now, this is an improvement on previous years, and it's good, but still not ideal, and progress has been very slow. And of course, it's it's not an architecture only problem when we zoom out and look at the built environment more generally the latest figures I could find were about I think 12 to 13 percent of engineers in the UK are women uh, the planning profession uh, fares a bit better with I think about 40 percent of planners being women it'll be interesting to see what those figures show following uh, Covid 
and uh, the pandemic. Uh, when we look at um, race and ethnicity, specifically focused on those that identify as being black, um, this is just 1% of registered architects in the UK that are black, and that's a downward facing figure. Um, I think 9% of engineers are um, BAME, and now BAME is a huge grab of where to identify. Yeah. Uh, um, so, I mean, we need, I think engineers need to drill down those figures as well, but even just looking at the 9%, it, it's not great. So I think those figures evidence that there's a lot of work to be done to make architecture um, more equi a, a more equitable profession. And that goes hand in hand with ensuring that the work we produce, kind of the homes, the buildings are also equitable. So when we talk about kind of increasing the uh, involvement of people that design cities and make decisions about the way we live, you know, for, for me, that's not about saying that men design badly or that women would design much better or that your ethnicity or economic um, background makes you a worse or better architect. Rather, I think it's about um, there needing to be acknowledgement that we all interact with the world in, in different ways, in, in some cases in very dis distinct ways. I think individual bodies perceive space in different ways and there are also cultural differences in the way spaces are used. So it, it's, um, or it should be a no-brainer that the more people from varying backgrounds, abilities, perspe uh, perspectives, genders that you have that are part of the kind of design and decision-making process, the better the outcomes in, in terms of the city spaces, homes, schools um, that, that we're building, um, you know, and these spaces will therefore be inclusive and work for, for the majority. And as I say, the Meridian Water team have gone to great efforts in procurement to make sure that they're very, looking very distinctly about the um, demographics of the people that they are hiring to, to design our, our city. And you say it's very much against the grain, a uh, bit of bit of a fight there for, for Peter to try to to push for for the kind of procurement levels that he's he's asking for. Um, but it's it, that's definitely a good thing, isn't Marion, to hear that kind of uh, you know get, getting the stakeholders, if you like, um, pushing for accountability as well. I think yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's great to hear that the construction industry is changing and manoeuvring, and I think. Um, just to touch on what Yemi was saying, um, I think it's still important that we acknowledge that we have a long way to go. You know, this is just the start, and uh, but it's great to see efforts are being made, and we have to acknowledge these and commend them. You know, um, as I said, why don't we have an award for the most? You know, maybe the diverse uh, procurement efforts that would be interesting. You know, really show it to everyone else that you know this is the the best way to go. And I bet you even that project will be one of the most interesting. But I just wanted to touch on what Yemi was saying um, with some statistics as well. For example, um, those who are Black or Black British identify uh, only 1.5% uh, in 2018 and 19 passed their part three. Well, if someone was white, that's 85.1%. You know, that is a kind of staggering number and it showcases that there are people who are, um, where their voices aren't really being heard or being acknowledged in the profession. And we have a duty to really provide equity and equality and access to everyone, you know, regardless of your race. Um, and I think these unique perspectives that Yumi was touching on is absolutely key. You know, I think there are so many, um, I think statistics that say that workplace diversity leads to better decision-making. If uh, a diverse team is made of a business decision, they usually outperform by their the other individual decision makers by 87% um, because of that diverse team. You know, if racially and ethnically diverse companies outperform industry norms by 35%, you know, this, this showcases that uh, um, it's not only uh, it would be nice to have a diverse uh, people, it's, it's also the knowledge is much greater. It's showcasing that better decisions are being made. And that's because we're different minds from different backgrounds are at work here. And I think it's actually, it's good that we have differences because then we'd have really boring buildings and really boring infrastructure if it just came down to like one person's opinion. When it's many people, it's at least you're having conversation. 
A really, really good point. And, and uh, that, that about just having the diversity of people, it's really important that the inclusive culture, that listening piece, because it's all well and good to surround yourself with the diversity of people, but we really need to listen uh, to those perspectives, especially if they're very different to our own. And your point, you've, you've made it a couple of times now, Mariam, I will take it away. I am working on the, uh, the award thing, but I don't want to say anything without, uh, there's been no ratification or anything like that and uh, the um, uh, the plan is for uh, the inclusion charter to take on a completely new life and, and and for people to to be held accountable for those and those who who do well to maybe rec be recognized in some way so it's all in my head at the moment but I'm working on it uh, but this this would be Reba radio is very much about um, those voices that we're, we're listening to over the 28 hours uh, me listening to them as well so that I can move forward as Director of Inclusion in the RIBA to make sure that we can be as inclusive as we possibly can in this profession. So um, both of you, um, I'd really like to hear from you. What have you seen that's really good? What have you seen that's really worth, um, you know, the, the, the other uh, practices and members turning to and saying, you know, they do things really, really well. And I think a good example is uh, the way Meridian Water are holding their, um, uh, their uh, clients to, to account um, uh, and, and other people. Who, who else could you point to, Miriam? Um, I would say the Manchester School of Architecture has uh, an interesting BLM group, Black Lives Matter movement, and they they were set up by uh, a few of the members. One of them is Elise, who uh, was my colleague, and it's quite interesting how that kind of took its own props after the Black Lives Matter movement. They set up an Instagram and they really try to promote um, inclusivity also in education, you know, not only being taught about white architects, but also having different architects um, you know, even in your own brief, uh, when you're given at university, it's, uh, it's a bit of a shame that sometimes uh, in our own education, there's a bit of bias. You're only taught about these white male architects and what they presume is amazing architecture, when then we get to, we miss out on this lovely vernacular, authentic architecture from other regions. And uh, I think what's interesting is that um, at least these kind of groups are bringing up this to the faculty and to the university as well. And it's nice to see students getting their voices across and uh, and being listened to. Yeah. And, and also in, in Bath, actually, their uh, decolonization um, group have been holding uh, their lecturers to account uh, around, you know, who, who is influencing the curricula there. And we'll hear from uh, the Bath Uni uh, group, uh, decolonization, uh, Decolonizing Architecture, uh, when we talk about that with Neil Shastral and um, Corinne Fowler, I think on Wednesday. Um, Yemi, what about great practice that you've seen? Oh, okay. So we've already mentioned Meridian, <laughs> Meridian Water and completely agree with um, Miriam. I think the Manchester School, um, their students have been brilliant and also contributed, I should say, to the uh, to um, my chapter on uh, kind of inclusion and diversity within the president's fact finding mission. Also, I would add Queen's University, the students there, the architecture um, students there, again, have just taken it upon themselves to develop something, not, you know, ask for permission, just get up and do and really inviting people externally to come and talk, also talk to the students so the students can understand vast varying things. And then also for them to say, actually, we want to take action. These are the kind of people we, we want to hear from. And I think that educational piece is great. In terms of practices, generally, I probably won't mention them um, one by one, but the really fantastic practices that I've seen as pra um, have been those, um, firms that have said you know they're not just going to go out and start coming up with solutions but they're going to listen so they've had a process of really just listening to um to what um their um kind of employees uh, are saying before saying right okay th this is what we're going to do I think listening is so important and genuine listening right <laughs> so that you could so that you can plan ways forward the other thing I just wanted to get in there is that um uh, Marsha, you might want to look at the local government awards. 
um, because there was, um, and uh, Meridian Water, I'm very proud to say, um, won the Diversity Inclusion Award there. Um, I, I can't claim anything from that as I just started two weeks ago, but that's all the Meridian team um, doing some fantastic work there, but there might be some um, cool tips there for whatever's coming next for the RIBA. Yeah, and I just on that listening piece, just want to uh, remind people that uh, the Reba Communities was something that was launched a, a little bit earlier this year. This is six groups of lived experience where um, uh, it started for staff and it will roll out for members next year. These groups are about listening. They're about safe psychological spaces, put it the other way around, psychologically safe spaces for people of lived experience to be able to share, uh, but funnel effectually uh, their experiences and they're not there to do the work they're there to alert me and and those in leadership in the architectural profession this is what the issue is this is what we need addressing right now um, etc and so uh, really important so that we can take that knowledge and take it on so uh, we can make effective use of that listening uh, and action uh, that listening has to follow with action doesn't it Mariam? of course and hopefully, you know, we see some more people who are, I mean, I think young people really should start making practices be accountable. We want to work for places that are diverse. So, you know, if you want to have, you know, a bunch of really interesting young people, you want to continue your work, you know, try and do it that way as well. That's what, that's what the future wants. Yemi Elidrin and Mariam I'll hear him I'll get that I will get that right at some point Mariam I promise uh, Reba members if you would like to sign up and commit to the inclusion charter you can do so by going to architecture.com and searching inclusion charter there is an online form for you to fill in and I really will be working super hard to support you in your journey don't forget, between 5 and 6 p.m. today, we have my soundtrack with Rita Ray, the broadcaster and singer. It's a, it's a real treat. And coming up in the next hour, we have with us some great architecture activists, if they don't mind me calling them that, about the state of inclusion in architecture today. <laughs> Take a chance and enter the River Radio Lucky Prize Draw. Indeed, take a chance. We have two fabuloso prizes to give away. Win a two-night stay for you and a friend. Or lover. In one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses. Uniquely designed, these funky luxury retreats, they include fab things for pampering stay like hot tubs, saunas, cargo net day beds suspended above a stream beneath the no canopy. <laughs> am, I, am I making it sound good? There are wood, wood burning stoves if it's chilly. <laughs> the tree houses are a perfect place to escape to and get away from it all. Isn't that a fabulous prize? But not just that. You can also win uh, or be in the chance of winning something else, which is tickets to see the specials live. Their show next July in Dublin sold out ages ago, but we've managed to secure two tickets for our lucky winners, plus a night stay at a hotel of your choice in Dublin, up to the value of £200. And that's Saturday, the 2nd of July, uh, 2022, at Trinity College, Dublin. To enter the draw, go to the Reba Radio webpage on architecture.com and just fill in the form and you need a magic word. And that magic word is giraffe, giraffe. So put that in and winners will be announced live during the last Reba Radio broadcast next Friday. Plus, each entry will receive a limited edition booklet that folds out in a unique way. And it reveals a really striking, really beautiful designed A2 poster with 10 top tips for inclusion. It's an absolute must for your office wall. Those 10 top tips have been scribbled together by me and full terms and conditions can be found on architecture.com. Now, earlier, I promised you that I will uh, tell you a little bit more about some of the definitions around diversity, uh, equity and inclusion. So diversity, what, what is that? Diversity is simply the mix 
of visible and invisible difference. So it includes things such as uh, age, ethnicity, nationality, different physical ability, sexual orientation, religion, communication styles, education, neurodivergence and so on. Um, the, the Equality Act of 2010, it talks about difference in terms of nine protected characteristics. But I've always said that this in itself is an issue because it forces us to silo difference. I'm not entirely sure that's the right thing to do. So you're better off talking about underrepresentation and hiring for diversity rather than hiring a diverse candidate. Uh, inclusion is the culture where people feel that their different values and perspectives are taken into account. Uh, and e equality is about everyone getting the same, which is fine if you're all at the same start point, but we know that isn't always the case. And equity speaks to equality of access based on your needs and making up for historic imbalance. So that's diversity, inclusion, equality and equity. I say diversity is the mix, inclusion is the culture, Equity is the impact. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects. With Reba Radio, we're bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in that foundational behavioral principle of CQ cultural intelligence. Uh, we've had an overview of the situation, some background today. We've heard from Dr. David Livermore uh, about what is CQ. We've heard from uh, Dr. Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias. We've heard from Yemi Aladaran and Mariam Alhiriam about the Reba Inclusion Charter and how we're looking at the efforts that have been made into inclusion up till now. Reba Radio with Marsha Rebu. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramroop, I'm the Director of Inclusion here. We are bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything that you do, and it's all rooted in that foundational behavioural principle of CQ cultural intelligence. Uh, we've just been listening to Yemi and Mariam talking about the Reba Inclusion Charter, about what efforts have been made in EDI uh, to bring about more diversity in the profession up until now. If you hear me talking about EDI, EDI is equity, diversity and inclusion. And we're going to be joined shortly by Samita Singer OBE, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki to discuss this in a moment. A reminder, if you've missed any of this morning's content and you'd like to catch up, it is possible by staying tuned to this link. We're repeating all of the content right here. You need no other radio station uh, because we've got great music too. And coming up later, we have this. Hello, this is DJ Rita Ray. Tune into my soundtrack on Reba Radio today at 5 p.m. It's all about celebrating diversity and inclusion with tracks from Arlo Parks, Erilyn Wallen, T.Y., Jazz Jamaica, just to name a few. See you there. You're listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, brilliant action. I'm delighted to say that here on Reba Radio, we're joined by Samita Singa OBE, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki to talk about the context of inclusion in architecture today. Um, and what's really great is you're my first live guests in the bookshop, in the studio. Come on, yes. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> There is a real, there are real people in here with me, which is great. And to see Tom, Tom, it's the first time I'm seeing you in 3D, uh, Samita. I've had the pleasure of meeting you before. Um, I'm going to start with you, Samita, if I may. Um, how would you describe yourself and uh, why are you passionate about inclusion in architecture? Oh, okay. So um, how would I describe myself? I would say I'm a mum. I don't know why I said that first, but I'm, I'm a migrant woman. I'm an international person um, and yeah, I'm an inclusive person as well. And, and why, why are you so passionate about inclusion in architecture? Um, my, my experiences uh, of um, coming to this country 
and trying to work as an architect have really influenced the way I see inclusion because um, when I came here, I didn't feel included. And um, so I set about finding ways that we could actually include people with an architecture. So I think that set off my enthusiasm for inclusion because without inclusion, you can't have architecture. Tom, uh, you yourself, how would you describe yourself and why are you passionate about inclusion in architecture? Um, I'd describe myself, I guess, foremost an architect. Um, and I, my, my passion for diversity started when I was at university doing my undergrad. And the Christian Union did a talk on homosexuality in the Bible. And they had a trainee vicar come in. And normally they had about 10 attendees. And this one had a couple of hundred and he said, you couldn't be gay and Christian. Oh, wow. And that was the start of my sort of diversity journey. And we put a talk on in response. And we had a vicar and we had a rabbi. And it was an inclusive talk. And we said, yes, you can be gay and have a religion. And that event is still going today, 16 years later, National Student Pride. And it centers around conversation, and debate and talk. And it was off the back of that that I then got involved within diversity within architecture and started Architecture LGBT six years ago. Oh, we'll talk to you more about that in a second. And Mwiwa, if I can ask you that same question, how would you describe yourself and uh, uh, why are you passionate about inclusion in architecture? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll describe myself. I'm an architect, I'm a Nigerian architect. I was born in Nigeria, grew up in London. Uh, South London, big up. Um, and um, I recently moved um, to the design and digital team at MACE um, from my previous practice um, a, at Grimshaw Architects. Um, and I was found a founder of the chair and of the founder and chair of the uh, multi ethnic um, group and allies, the Mecca Network at uh, Grimshaw, uh, which was founded two, two three years ago. Um, and um, sort of the role sort of try to drive cultural change for our colleague globally. Um, and my passion for um, inclusion sort of started in my university years, but it also got sort of germinated throughout um, my uh, professional practice. Um, and the reason I am a little bit more um, uh, passionate about it is because I feel like um, I, 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 I sort of look towards the next generation, which I think I am part of. Uh, the sort of the, the, the fervent, the vigor, and the sort of um, uh, the drive that they have to change things, I feel is something that needs to be celebrated and bring to the fore. And I feel I'm, 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 I could be a spokesperson for, for that movement. Thanks very much for, for those introductions. And it's been quite a journey, really, hasn't it? This, this idea of, of inclusion in architecture. Um, Samita, um, <laughs> you've been on this journey a long time. I, I, <laughs> I don't want to overemphasize it, but um, you, you, know, you started Architects for, for Change. Tell me about the journey to get to that, that point. Okay, thanks. So yes, it's it's been an interesting journey and a journey of inclusion. And I think my experiences have shaped my intention towards inclusion. So my first defining experience is that I was born and brought up in India, which is a very diverse and multicultural society. So I have my family um, where there are people of all different colors. So if my uncle was here, he'd be called black, for example and um, have friends who speak different languages. I speak five. Um, we have so many festivals. So I studied my part one and two in India. And I had very strong role models uh, in Delhi, like Arundhati Roy, who was uh, four years senior to me at the School wow. of Architecture. That, that's quite a name drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she really inspired me. And then I had uh, female teachers like Revati Kamath, who sadly died last year, Nalani Thakur, and you know, really strong women. So I got, uh, I come from very poor family, so uh, but I did well at architecture. I got a scholarship to study environmental design, which wasn't known very much in those days, 30 years ago. 
And um, I came to study at Cambridge uh, to do my master's. And um, I settled in the UK. And it was a shock to me because I just thought, surely UK is far ahead in inclusion and, you know, women are far ahead. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't. So I was having a huge struggle getting work. I joined Women in Architecture in 1996 and I became chair of Women in Architecture in 1999. And then um, it was announced that Women in Architecture was going to be disbanded. <laughs> just after a few months after I'd become chair and I'd started organizing events and I thought well let's think bigger and we were going to maybe made into a special interest group and I said well being a woman isn't a special interest and <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I luckily had a very good supportive vice chair and together we had was this, this at the RIBA to be yes, clear right. yes so these were these were RIBA committees Yes, that worked. So the women in architecture one was disbanded because it was being made into a special interest group. Um, well, the RIBA supported women in architecture, but I think it was mostly independent of the RIBA. We had our meetings here, but they said we don't want anything. We're just going to have special interest groups. And so I said, fine, we're going to have this huge group, which is going to include women, black architects, students, disabled people, LGBTQ+. Plus, you know, everybody we could think of who weren't included in the mainstream. And we didn't have a name, and it was Tony Chapman who came up with the name Architects for Change. And um, I kept working towards it, and it was uh, approved by the RRBA Council in January 2000. And then I had to find people to populate the different posts. Um, and so, but I kept being chair of women in architecture. We had a wonderful um, lecture by Julia Barfield, I remember that, and different events. Um, and then in July, we finally had the people in place and we were inaugurated in this building. Um, and we had, for example, I left being the chair of women in architecture and Angela Brady took over as women in architecture chair. Um, she later became president of the RIBA. We've had Helen Taylor. We've had amazing people, Virginia Newman, who I think who's still in AFC. And it's wonderful mm -hmm. to see that AFC is still continuing, still doing amazing work under different chairs. They're incredibly supportive of the work that I'm doing. And Tom, uh, Architecture LGB, LGBT+, plus, you know, you, you, just, you briefly described how that was born. Um, but, you know, certainly a, a lot of work going on there as well. Tell us a little bit about uh, about that so we started in london and with a pride breakfast which we held at the rba um and then we sort of built over the years so we've now this year we've launched in scotland uh last couple of years ago we launched in manchester we've got a network going into the northeast and the southwest so we're sort of expanding around the uk and sort of creating a safe space for lgbt plus architects and those working within the profession to meet other people, have support, role models, mentorship and events. Uh, it's great to hear. Certainly there's um, a sense that the, the need for it, has it been always welcomed uh, within, you know, if we're talking about the context of the, the journey to inclusion in architecture, has, has it been straightforward to, to have Pride events? No. Um, when we first approached the ROBA, we were told we had to hire the space at, cor at corporate rates. So we had a bit of an internal fight till we got given the staff building. Um, we found companies coming on board as sponsors relatively straightforward and we've got a lot of a lot of um, financial support from architecture practices, which is how we fund everything we do. Um, and it's been a bit of a journey of inclusion within within. So our first event was 95% white men. And there's been a real drive to make everyone feel welcome and at the events and supported. So we've been having a huge push on intersectionality and making sure 50% of our team is women and really trying to be an inclusive organisation. 
Yeah, I think it's really important when it comes to whatever identifier that we appear to be grouped into, whether it's uh, around underrepresented racialized groups or or sexuality or, or gender, that uh, there is still a lot of difference within each of those groups. Um, Mwiwa, uh, you recently featured in our Black History Month campaign, uh, spotlighting great talent. You know, what well, actually, I'll be really curious to know what was your dis your thinking behind the decision to actually agree to do that why was it important for you well um i the reason why i agreed to do it was because there there needs to be more uh, vis visibility of uh of of um of, of different races within the architecture profession so that people know that it, it is possible to be a, a black architect and there's an interesting quote that I saw when I was looking into this. It was like um, visibility is like the like having more visibility is like one of the first steps to to um, to just sort of understand uh, the, your your path. Um, and saying that, I was also um, profiled in um, one of um, um, uh, an artist. Um, so who runs the Black British Network, Cephas Williams. He, he did this art portrait about, called the Portrait of Black Britain. And what he was trying to do, I don't know if you've known about it, what he was trying to do is to like sort of showcase like the variety of um, the Black experience because the Black experience isn't uh, a monoculture. Um, and if we put more, put more spaces to, um, to Black faces around it, it, in architecture, it, it becomes, it's this, it's this, it's this other um, uh, way of, of influencing the younger generations to do uh, to go into the profession. Really, really important point, actually. Um, Cephas isn't going to be joining us, but his wife Deborah uh, will be uh, talking about the Women's Association on uh, Reba Radio. Uh, we'll be back speaking with Samita Singer, Tom Guy, and We Were Oki uh, to talk about the context of inclusion in architecture. You're listening to Reba Radio with me, Marsha Ramrup, Director of Inclusion at the RIBA. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about CQ Drive, which is all about motivating yourself to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. So we'll be talking about fear, about cancel culture, discomfort, white shame. We'll also be talking about the data piece and how to intrinsically motivate yourself. And in the last hour, we were speaking about the Reba Inclusion Charter uh, and about what efforts have been made around EDI there in the profession up till now. Um, but if you'd like to catch up with that, there will be a subtitled video on uh, Reba, the Reba YouTube channel, as soon as we can and hopefully within the next 24 hours. So stand by. Meanwhile, you can listen again as we repeat all of today's content on this link. We're joined by Samita Singer OBE, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki talking about the context of inclusion in architecture today. We've heard a little bit of history uh, from the three of them. And I'm really curious to, to hear from you about your, your thoughts on the idea of progress. Have we actually made any around inclusion in the times that you've been working and campaigning for inclusion in your different ways? If I can start with you, Moiwa, what, what, what are your views on that? Um, well, if I look at my sort of um, experience you know, my, uh, from, from 2010, when I sort of started, my consciousness of started being consciously aware of architecture and architectural profession to now, in that 10 year span, um, I feel, yes, there are, there is progress. For example, um, each, for the, each of the um, um, practices that I worked at, at MACE, at uh, 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 Grimshaw, we have uh, diverse networks. Um, MACE has like seven, sort of covered all the different aspects of diversity. Uh, Grimshaw had five, and that wasn't a normal, that's sort of normal now, but it wasn't a normal thing um, let's say back in 2010 when I was doing my part one and things. So I think, yes, there is the progress in that. Um, but then I'll, I'll, also, I'll also try to say, if we're thinking about diversity of thought, diversity of thinking, diversity of sort of approach, I also, I also say there is some way to go because I, I believe, um, which I'm also practicing because that architects don't need to actually work in uh, sort of design led practices. I feel like we need to be sort of going out into wider industries, um, sort of taking 
the learnings from different um, industries and different sectors and trying to put that into practice within the architecture industry. For example, in, in, in the tech industry, for example, they have uh, this organization called um, UK Black Tech, uh, which builds sustainable diverse initiatives in tech so that, and also implement practices going to, it's a company that goes into different um, tech, technology um, uh, companies and uh, try to sort of uh, recruit um, uh, 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 people who are uh, mentors and interns to, to, so that they can get into the, the tech, tech world. Also in financial services, this, this initiative called 10,000 Black Interns, um, which so they've, in the past, past five years, they've tried to get 10,000 bl Black interns into professional financial services. And these are all this type of um, um, sort of initiatives that ordinarily architects don't know about because we're sort of siloed into the, the we're mm. working in design led practices. Would whereas you, we. Mm, I mean, uh, Sumita and, and Tom, would you say that that was a, a, a valuable thing to do or something that's already being done? What are your thoughts on what we were as to say? So I think industry other industries have been a long way ahead of architecture. And mm. so for example, in 1984, IBM introduced a gender and um, sexuality policy. Four years later, Margaret Thatcher's government implemented section 28 ban banning the promotion of homosexuality in schools. The reason IBM did that in 1984 is because they understood the business case for inclusion. And if your staff are themselves at work and they're happy, they perform better and they stay longer. And I think the corporate world understood that and progressed a lot quicker than architecture. Maybe a lot of that is down to the size of practices. We have much smaller, uh, we have a lot of medium, small size practices and our big practices aren't big compared to corporate. So actually the initiatives, you know, the 10,000 uh, black st uh, people, students into finance is the, the industry, the bigger corporate industry, I think, understands that better. Yeah. Um, I think besides just the economic um, output, I think it's really important also to think of architecture as a creative profession. So the more diversity you have, the more creativity you actually have, which is, uh, which is wonderful. So, um, you know, I often compare architecture to, say, the fashion industry. You know, you have couture, uh, um, the, you know, the fashion industry. And, and they work with such diverse ideas, you know, they draw in, um, you know, uh, prints maybe from Africa, maybe some weaving from Asia, um, you know, they all put it together and they come up with this wonderful infusion of things, whereas architecture has failed in that way to include um, not just people, but also the cultures that come with people. So I think it would benefit as Tom's saying, you know, economically, and as Muiva was saying about, you know, um, the next generation, you know, encouraging the next generation, I think it would also become a richer, um, uh, you know, it would have a rich, richer product if we kind of thought of inclusion in a wider sense. Mm -hmm. And in terms of actions that can be taken, um, uh, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm rolling out the the, the CQ uh, work, and I, I'm going to put my neck on the block here, Samita, because you've you've done my CQ workshop. Um, is is CQ any 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 good? Actually, before you answer that, <laughs> we haven't rehearsed this. I've just created 28 hours of content to move people forward using the idea of CQ, uh, but, but, but all different contexts and ideas and perspectives are really important so i'm i'm bracing myself samisa what do you think about cq oh thank you yeah i had a very interesting experience doing the cq and thank you very much for for doing it <laughs> i feel like I there's a butt coming <laughs> oh well the thing is that um you know i was talking about defining experiences so being a migrant woman who, who has worked in six countries and travel to 47. I'm aware that there are lots more I haven't been to, but um, you know, the idea of cultures and including cultures is, is really important for me. And the RIBA is in 115 countries, and we often forget that when we are at the, you know, in this building. It's just 
us and the British and etc. But, you know, I was in an RIBA validated school in Delhi. So for me, it was really important that when I came here, that I was part of this inclusion, inclusion process. So, um, you know, signing diversity uh, or inclusion charters is great. I know the NLA is also doing something like that. The RIBA has got an inclusion charter and cultural training. But I think it's a first step because if you truly embrace um, someone, you don't really need to sign anything in a way. Mm. You just include it mm. in your day-to-day -day work. Mm. And how do, you, how do you translate that inclusion to the cultures of different countries? What does inclusion mean to someone in, say, in uh, Malaysia? or in China, mm. how would we reflect on that in a cultural way? Not in a sense that, you know, this is Britain, this is how we do it, but to be more inclusive of other countries and other cultures. Mm. So, you know, definitely uh, CQ uh, is, is about working, relating effectively with people who have backgrounds that are, are different to us. But I, I was reflecting um, that actually even our own family members who might have really similar backgrounds, uh, CQ can be really helpful in terms of helping us navigate when you kind of develop different values. So uh, it's, it's, it's a, a useful piece of work to, it's, as you say, that first foundational step so that you can then start to approach everything with uh, applying your CQ lens. Uh, Tom, if I were to turn to you and say, what actions, useful actions, have you seen practice put in place up until this point to, to try to be more inclusive? At our Christmas event a few years ago, fosters realised, foster and partners realised that they there was that some of their staff were coming to our event, but they weren't out at work. And after that, they set up an internal LGBT plus network and became platinum spots of our network. And since then, they've seen a huge change in the number of people that are out, comfortable and being themselves. And it was similar at Grimshaw's. Grimshaw's didn't have an LGBT network and they announced their gold sponsorship of our event at a CPD, lunchtime CPD, that Emily from Fosters, who's our vice chair, and I went along to and then started an internal network themselves. And practices may think you know they they've signed that charter but it doesn't necessarily mean that the part one who can't see an lgbt plus role model or um that feels that actually they can come out because they might have heard a homophobic slur or a transphobic slur or th there's the reassurance that their project architect is going to be supportive of them not just a bit of paper that's been signed by the practice Really good point. And a reminder that the Reba communities, uh, those six groups of lived experience, uh, ones for race and religion, uh, economic diversity, uh, women, those with unpaid caring responsibilities, um, enable is, is those with uh, disabilities and neurodiverse. Uh, I've forgotten the other two. Um, there are two more, <laughs> which escape me at the moment, but the point is they're for, they're for staff at the RIBA at the moment, but the intention is to open those up to members so that people can feel there's a safe uh, space. But I think your point, Tom, is that not only uh, should there be something external for staff, but something internal as well in different practices. Absolutely. And I think it, that's much easier for the big practices. It gets much harder as you get down to small and medium sized practices, of which there are many. So in those situations, it's about ensuring that language is modified and charters are signed, but actually read and understood and um, making sure everyone feels welcome to be themselves. And in an LGBT context, you can't, you can hide it. So you, you can't hide your gender, but you can hide your, um, your sexuality. I'll correct myself, you can if you're trans. So um, I, well, I worked at Nicholas Hair Architects after my part two, and it was a really inclusive employ employer. I felt I could be myself, but one of my colleagues who was on the team I was working on didn't come out until after he'd left. And everyone has their own personal journey. And actually that needs to be understood that someone might not be out, but could be facing their own internal dilemma, which could be to, to do with family or religion or or just how comfortable they are and i think a lot of my generation have got internalized homophobia from 
the results of Section 28, which banned any mention of being LGBT in school. Mm. So we grew up in a in a society where newspapers were anti-LGBT. There was no one or nothing that said it's okay to be yourself. Mm. We're speaking to Sumita Singer OB, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki, talking about the context of inclusion in architecture, and we'll hear more from them shortly. If you go to rebabooks.com forward slash Reba Radio, all the authors and books and the themes around diversity and inclusion appearing on air, you can get hold of their work at a discount. You can come into the bookshop here. That's where we're broadcasting from at 66 Portland Place. And you can pick up copies. Uh, also, Dr. David Livermore, when he was here recording, he signed his copies of Leading with Cultural Intelligence. It was actually the book that brought me to cultural intelligence. So I do recommend it. And Samita your book about future healthcare design which came out last year that is here too so please come along and check that out earlier i was speaking to yemi and Miriam. Uh, they're really active reba members about the inclusion charter if you would like to sign up and commit to it certainly reba radio will help you with those commitments uh, you can do so by going to architecture.com and searching for inclusion charter where there is, is an online form for you to fill in and i am going to continue to work hard to support you in your journey. We're speaking to Samita Singer, uh, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki about the context of archi um, inclusion in architecture. And um, Mwiwa, uh, can I just ask you about um, what, what measures do you think can be put in place uh, that practice can to really track how, how they're developing an inclusive culture? And what have you seen done that is worth shouting about? Right. Um, so I'm going to answer this question in two ways, um, because I think your, your, the, answer, the question you asked was about what practices are doing, which is great. But also, I was also would like to think about what Reba could be doing. Um, Go for it. Uh, so, uh, so one thing is, well, it's quite important to me anyway, is role modeling and mentorship. Um, there needs to, like I was saying earlier, um, Increased visibility is an important step towards greater diversity. So if you increase the visibility of the different types of diverse individuals within the organization, diversity happens. And um, then I can also then sort of put, I, I know that that's happened because in the practices that I work, I work, work, work in, Grimshaw, where I was previously in MACE, there is that um, visible, visible presence of the different diverse uh, black, uh, architects, black uh, construction managers, et cetera, who, who are actually making waves throughout the ranks of, 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 the, um, of, 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 their, uh, of the companies, especially in MACE. Um, but also I, then, I have to then, then ask about what we were, what Reba we, we role models and mentors are, are, are is, is, is there much done about that to like spotlight um, uh, a black or diverse, uh, talent within the architecture um, profession. I, I, that, I'll leave, you, leave that, up, that to be answered by, um, by, by yourself. Um, but I also said, I, I also think the way to do that is in two ways, because um, we can either all be, like I said, in architecture design practices, or we can move around into different industries. Um, and if I just sort of touch on, on what uh, Sumisha said about creativity and architecture as a creative industry, um, similar to the fashion industry, I, I sort of disagree a little because I think most industries are creative industries. They're designers, especially ones who design the urban environment. They are doing somewhat architecture uh, related work, but they, are, they don't have the title of architects. They don't are not members of uh, the RIBA because maybe they are members of different bodies. And I think there is something that we will need to do to bring those kind of people back into the fold of membership so that there is more people. There are more, uh, there's a bigger pool of, of talent to role model. Because if we're just talking insularly in the sort of design architecture, design uh, smaller practices or 100 per person practices, there aren't going to be that many black architects to, who are in uh, sort of um, the higher echelons of, 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 of the industry to, 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 role, to role model. Because when I was growing up, it was only David Adright, you know? 
Um, so there are people who are in uh, architect adjacent industries, like for example, the tech industry, who like people who are working in like startup companies um, doing something radical affecting the built environment, but they're not architects. They don't want to be called architects. They don't feel like they are architects. Tom Sweezy, so, do you have anything to, to, to come off the boat, to, to add to that? Um, absolutely. I, th I think, to um, for me, three things are really important, um, some of which Mueva was talking about. So one is visibility. And it's really important to have visibility of different cultures, different ethnicities, within architecture. And, uh, you know, when AFC was actually um, formed, I think I said a few months later, our job would be done when we're actually disbanded. <laughs> but yeah. uh, 21 yeah. years later, we're still there. So obviously there's work to be done. So visibility is really important. And how do we find visibility? So a lot of practices, um, you know, um, sign up to things, but you look at their leadership, you look at their boards, you know, how many people of color, how many people, uh, you know, from um, LGBTQ plus who are openly, you know, so are there on the board, you know, how many women are there on the board? For me, that is showing how, what an inclusive culture it is. So unless you can show, you don't, you don't sign, you don't tell, you show it, you show how inclusivity works, then mm. I'll believe you. And then um, the second thing for me is very important is the voice, having a voice. Because, you know, as Mueva was saying, you know, you can have maybe people, but what kind of voices do they have? Are they able to influence? And as Tom was saying, you know, one of his colleagues was not able to actually come out until, you know, they finished, they came out of that practice. So if you're not able to have that voice to be able to speak your, uh, to sing your song, basically, you can't, um, you know, you can't be who you are. Mm. You can't contribute 100% to your work. And the third thing is culture. What is the culture of the practice? You know, there is the saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and that is really true mm. because you can have all these strategy of what uh, you can do for inclusive inclusion, but until you actually encourage this culture, you can't do anything. So I also work as a non-exec in the NHS. And um, it is not a very inclusive culture because, you know, you would find a lot of the BAME communities are in the lower echelons and the board is primar primarily white. And I set up, I co-founded a group called the Seacall Group, uh, which promotes um, non-execs from different backgrounds into uh, the NHS boards. And um, this is another thing, you know, that how do we actually push people up? to be visible, to be leaders. And then, you know, as Mui was saying about David Ajay, you know, that inspired him. So mm. we need many more people like that up there, visible, and the RIBA could do much more for that. And, and Tom, I mean, uh, just to, to pick up on your, on your points, by the way, Mui, I've made notes. So uh, I'll, I'll certainly be, be, be taking all of that up and, and, and Sumit is always in my ear. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't need to necessarily take notes. She's on me all the time, which is great. This is what I need. So I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Tom, what, what are your thoughts on, on those measures and, and certainly some outcomes that you'd like to see as well? well? The first thing on top of my head is just what Samita was saying. Angela Dapper was brought in at Grimshaw's as a principal and she's transformed their diversity, like making sure there's a woman at every single interview. And they suddenly got a lot more women at the top. And it's completely, it's driving change, not just strategy. Um, something I've not really talked about, but is, is transgender people are currently under attack across the media. And um, there's not that many trans visible architects. Uh, there's a few, but it, it's, I think, the next level of, of providing spaces where people feel they can be themselves and they can transition and it's it's things like providing gender neutral toilets stanton williams have been encouraging their staff to include their pronouns in their email signatures and it's it's giving people the voice to be themselves um and hate crime against trans people is trebled in recent years um five lgbt staff have quit the bbc 
because of them pulling out of the Stonewall Diversity Index and for a lot of transphobic articles that are going up. So it's in the media and it's around us and people absorb that. And that, I think, is really important that the RFDA and groups like Architecture LGBT are, are trying to make a trans-inclusive environment. Yeah, really, really important points. Thanks for highlighting that. And uh, we hope to talk a, a bit about that on uh, Monday or Tuesday next week. I'm sorry, I haven't held the schedule in my head, but certainly we are, are talking. And, and unfortunately, not with a, a, a trans architect, but someone who's in uh, construction. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Christina Riley, who you may know, is, is going to be coming on air to, to highlight the lived experience of trans lives as well. Um, we were coming back to you then. Um, let's assume I've done everything that you've asked. What does that look like and feel like to you? Hey, um, it'll be, how would it, what would it look like? Um, it'll, it'll mean that um, as an architect, I have a plethora of options. Uh, when I finish my architecture training, which is like, it's pretty long, you, you know, I know that, um, there is a different avenues that I can, um, that is open to me that I can go into. And there are people like, who look like me, who was, have similar backgrounds like me, are, um, are there for me to like sort of reach out and have a connection with. Um, for example, I, on, on my, in my spare time, I, I work on a side project, um, uh, called modular and we're looking at um, making digital twins of spaces um, cheap and easy to use and ubiquitous just like digital photography is and we're looking across the landscape of architecture and like who are who is doing stuff like this like who can we talk to that are that could be a role model and there isn't that many people because the people who are um, doing it aren't architects well they don't they don't they're not in the Reba circle and um, that sort of duplicity or like multiplicity of um, experiences and different avenues to work um, is, is something that we should be championing so that it's not just, um, you know, going through seven, seven years of um, architecture education through this linear path. And actually, I have to say something, the ARB are looking at, they're doing, they had this white paper looking at the, the trying to reimagine the uh, education process. And I think that's something that we, if it gets unlocked and there is a multiplicity of uh, people who can join the, the architecture practice or people, ha people um, um, where people graduate um, the sort of formal uh, architecture uh, undergrad, postgrad, they can go to different um, uh, industries. I think that would make architecture mm. a richer, richer, richer um, uh, in industry and, and profession to, to be a part of. And uh, Samita, sort of to, to finally sum up, um, you're on council. What can you influence from there now, do you think? Um, well, this is, this is my second time in the council. So um, I'm, I'm just trying to see, you know, when, when, when I attended my first meeting um, this, this time, I just was counting the numbers of people of different ethnicities and cultures that were there. And I thought to myself sitting there, I'd like to see much more diversity in, in this room. And it, it's difficult to tell because it was a hybrid meeting somewhere in person, somewhere on the screen. So I haven't got the hang of it. I mean, at the moment it seems uh, pretty good, but I'd like to see say, um, you know, um, people f who are openly gay, you know, up there. I hadn't seen anyone um, mm. there. So, you know, all these different, different flavors, you know, like it's Indian food, you know, you put all these spices and it brings up all the flavors. I just want to see more flavor in the RIBA, <laughs> <laughs> not well, just bland stuff. That sounds like a good plan. But I just wanted to say something that happened last night, which illustrated how um, beautiful diversity could be. So I was at an architecture award last night and the MC was a comedian called Paul Sinha. Um, who actually shares my surname. The Chaser. <laughs> uh, sorry? Was it the Chase? You know, the guy who's on the chase. Yeah, is it? Is, no, maybe, uh, maybe not. I don't yeah, I I think know. It might be. Yeah, anyway, carry it on, might carry be, on with yeah, your story. So he was the MC and he was excellent. Now, the thing about him is that he suffers from Parkinson's disease 
and he was on the podium. You could see his hands were shaking, uh, but he carried on beautifully. He was funny. We were laughing at his jokes and everything, and he was very spontaneous. He would pick up a lot of the architects actually dropped their awards. and. He <laughs> So he picked up on that, said something funny. He's also openly gay mm. and he talked about, you know, how he got married and he was proposed in Italy and he said, how many openly gay architects are in this room? And not many hands up. I, mm. Of course, I couldn't see in the dark, but, um, you know, the, that sort of openness. And, and the thing with Paul was that he was himself, he was being himself. So despite his disability, despite being a person of color, you know, he, he was and just being disabled, being gay, he was just being himself. So what is the value that a, a person can bring? It's not like seeing it's seeing beyond all these different external things. But what is this person bringing to us? Savita Singer, OBE, Tom Guy and Mwiwa Oki, thank you so much for joining me on Reba Radio. <laughs> Take a chance. Enter the Reba Radio Lucky Prize draw. I really hope you will take a chance because you do have a chance to win two, one of two great prizes. Uh, one is a two night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses. But there's also the opportunity to win tickets to see the specials live. Uh, their show uh, next July in Dublin, it's sold out ages ago but we've managed to secure two tickets for our lucky winners plus a night stay at a hotel of your choice in dublin and that's up to the value of 200 pounds Woo! Oh look, this uh, this lot. Oh, they, oh, you know, we're four hours in. You still haven't got it, have you? Gee, because um, that's for Saturday, second of July at Trinity College, Dublin. So uh, to enter the draw, go to the Reba Radio webpage on architecture.com and just fill in the form. And the magic word you need is giraffe. Giraffe. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know who came up with that, but it, you know, <laughs> it's there anyway. Uh, the winners will be announced live during the last Reba Radio broadcast on Friday, the 26th of November. Full terms and conditions can be found on architecture.com, so make sure you check that out. That really does just about wrap it up for today. You've heard from Dr. David Livermore from uh, the CQ Centre about CQ, from Dr. Pragya Agarwal about unconscious bias, from Yemi Aluderan and Mariam al Irhayim about the Reba Inclusion Charter, and Samita Singer OBE, Tom Gwai and Mwiwa Oki about the context of inclusion in architecture today. You can listen to all of that programming again now on this link as we repeat the content and soon all of it will be accurately subtitled and up on the Reba YouTube channel, the Reba Radio playlist. Join us tomorrow as we deep dive into CQ Drive, managing discomfort and how to motivate yourself. Thank you for listening to day one of Reba Radio. Tomorrow we'll be back on air at nine o'clock. You've been listening to Reba Radio. Real, inclusive, brilliant action.